Welcome to Field Interference. I am your host, Ryan G. Bannister. The purpose of this show is to investigate complex topics to draw conclusions directly from empirical evidence while eliminating assumptions. And before we start, I'd like to mention that in this time of sensorial perception management and predictive programming, it's important to recognize that these big tech corporations do not want you to share the truth. I am no longer asking for anyone's permission to share what is true, what I know to the best of my ability, and that's why I've joined odyssey.com. That's O-D-Y-S-E-E dot com. You can search for field interference. My particular link is odyssey.com slash at field interference colon one. The following is my conversation with Bob Greenier of the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Bob Greenier has had a lifelong passion for technology with a particular interest in energy-related solutions. His career has allowed him to see inside the pharmaceutical, advertising, and banking industries, which led him to understand real issues across the world, including in India where he spent the best part of a decade of his life. In 2012, he chose to walk away from very profitable work in the city of London to focus on what he then understood to be the field of low-energy nuclear reactions, or LENR. He has been volunteering for the UK-based not-for-profit community interest company called Quantum Heat, which runs the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project, or MFMP. The independent MFMP completely supported by community donations and the sacrifices of its participating international researchers, pioneered live open research, which allowed an army of online parties to accelerate learning in the field. Since 2012, the MFMP has successfully tested and in some cases verified claims of low energy nuclear reactions, including Francesco Cellani's Constantin wire which is now a leading technology in a European Union-funded research consortium. Other technologies the organization has verified to produce low-energy nuclear reactions has been the nickel-hydrogen system, microwave plasma, OMASA gas, and HHO, and ultrasound. And in 2019, proposed an experiment that can be learned and conducted by a five-year-old inside 20 minutes with about $35 investment. Since 2017, his own research within the MFMP has led him to argue that coherent matter can be formed in a range of ways leading to the technological equivalent of natural ball lightning, and that this can not only fuse and fission matter, it can also synthesize and desynthesize matter, including the decay of baryonic matter to light and leptons. The process has profound implications in more than just energy. It has implications for matter reorganization, such as nuclear remediation, propulsion, and more. As a result of recognizing the enormous implications, he calls this the God's toolbox, and believes that this is an eternal technology that our ancestors have leveraged before. We are at the dawn of an old age. Search for MFMP on YouTube, and Twitter, and Facebook. Bob publishes much of his own work at remoteview.icu. And without further ado, here is my conversation with Bob Greenier. I think one of the first uh, videos I saw from you was a presentation you did in which you included um, uh, a segment about uh, Dr. Judy Woods, Where Did the Towers Go? Uh, at a, I think it was a low energy news nuclear reactions conference correct um i i think that might be the very first time that i um did that it would be in in um iat mumbai when i gave a presentation there possibly i don't know that would have been in um uh, beginning march 2017 so maybe it was before then i don't know but that 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 was I can't really say that it could have been much before then because it was only three days or four days before I gave that presentation that I actually realized the connection. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, that's um, I, I actually do remember that uh, you didn't start with that and it, it, it developed. Um, I, I've, I've really followed your, your work from early on and I, I was able to see that 
there was a point where it hit you that uh, Dr. Wood uh, uh, had some valid conclusions. And um, it, it was really nice to watch you present that at a scientific conference. Uh, I, I, um, it's rare to see. I, it, was, it was a choice I had yeah. to make between maintaining my integrity or walking away from the field. And my view was it was clear to me that the technology had already been weaponized. So the releasing of the technology in terms of making it clear for more people to understand was not going to change the fact that it's already been weaponized. Um, uh, but the benefits that could be gained uh, uh, that would uh, nullify many of the arguments that are used to suppress humanity and restrict humanity's uh, reach um, could be nullified uh, by um, recognizing it for what it can do for positive. And so I thought, really, I, I, I've come this far. I never expected to, to realize this. Um, but uh, given the fact that so many people have looked at this technology in the past and have probably never realized this, it's my duty to um, be honest and, uh, if necessary, sacrifice my reputation in the process. But that, so what? Right. Well, um, I, you know, I think that uh, this, what we're talking about in a technology, just to clarify, uh, is essentially the, the Hutchison effect or, or low energy nuclear reactions. Uh, there are many parallels uh, between that and what we see at the, uh, at the destruction of the World Trade Center on 9-11. Um, and so, would you like to elaborate? Yeah, so, uh, my, so. The, the sequence of events was um, I watched the 1989 presentation of Stanley Bonds and Martin Fleischmann, the whole announcement about cold fusion uh, back then as it was uh, named for them. And um, I was very, very much into science and energy. And uh, I, I was curious because it, it, it took them a long time to get to their um, press release, but it took very little time for their so-called findings um, uh, to be dismissed and summarily dismissed in a way that seemed really bizarre. I mean, I'd seen a lot of technologies being talked about in the past um, as potentially real. And then I'd watched, for instance, uh, in the pages of New Scientist, how over a number of years they were then found to be errors. And so I was familiar with scientists having their work not able to be replicated and, and then falsified. But this was something really uh, unique, and it, it struck very um, an odd tone with me, which stuck in my head. And so when um, Andrea Rossi in 2011 um, was starting to make a bit of noise in the field, I decided to take myself um, on my own dime uh, to South Korea, to the ICCF International uh, Conference on Cold Fusion 17 in uh, Daejeon at the KAIST Institute of Material Science. And uh, I met up with a couple of guys that had also decided to do pretty much the same thing. And we set up the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. And the premise for that was that many people were seemingly showing the same kind of range of effects, but they weren't really collaborating. And everyone wanted the Nobel Prize and, and you know, everyone wanted to be the person that showed how it worked. But therefore, there was very little... Um, uh, uh, sort of collaboration in the sense that people weren't replicating other people's findings. They, they were all trying to find their own explanation and, and try and argue that point. And so we thought, well, let's set up an independent body uh, and we can, if there's people that are willing to do uh, and share, uh, uh, work, to work with us and, and share their particular um, version of this uh, science, uh, maybe we could replicate it and that would therefore give them independent corroboration. And uh, if that could be done in a way that was live and on the internet uh, in, you know, a kind of first um, uh, where you actually see the protocol, you can challenge the protocol and suggest the protocol chick gets changed. You could uh, uh, follow the data live as it's created and you could challenge or even request um, uh, uh, changes to be made in the experiment during the course of the live experiment being uh, um, conducted. And this is it's almost like live, it, it was exactly live streaming a, an experiment. 
where anyone who thinks they know better or can offer some sort of insight could uh, interact and, and maybe discover something. And in fact, most of the really interesting things we found early on were observed in the data, sometimes when we were asleep, where third parties were monitoring the data and they found some anomalies and they debated them and, and they actually came out to be things that were very significant in the long term. And so uh, the first experiment we conducted was uh, Francesco Cellani's constant and wire, as you uh, uh, mentioned earlier in my bio. And uh, in fact, that technology is now, as, 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 as it was said earlier, um, that is leading uh, a consortium called Clean HME, uh, which is a number of different universities and, and uh, European institutions and, and private companies that are funded uh, by the European Union. I think that's either 5.5 or 6 million uh, euros over a five-year period. And, um, uh, you know, we, we effectively played a, a role uh, through that open science process in uh, convincing the European Union that this was something that they should fund. And, and so um, this is where the open community and the donors to the open work that we conducted have produced real uh, measurable uh, changes in policy making. And this is, like I say, it's the first real first time the European Union has funded this kind of work. So that's that's very satisfi satisfying outcome. But it was a, it was a long time from that through other significant events that led me um, to meet with uh, a guy called. Dr. George Eagley in October 2016 and I met him and I did a series of videos called Stardust which you can see on the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project's YouTube channel and they uh, work through his experiments in microwaves creating ball lightning analogs in a microwave using uh, carbon he calls it dusty plasma process and we uh, discussed his research which spanned a decade into um, actual anecdotes and uh, testimonies uh, spanning about a hundred years or so of people who had experienced ball lightning. And so it was with that in the back of my mind that at the beginning of 2017, I kind of was uh, researching uh, Ken Shoulders, uh, who is a guy who made the screening technology for microelectronics. He, some people call him the father of microelectronics. And if you have a phone uh, or you're watching this on a computer, you can thank Ken Shoulders for developing the technology to make microelectronics. Well, this guy also was brought in to explore the work of John Hutchison uh, after John Hutchison's observations in the late 1970s when he was combining uh, various uh, radio frequencies with static electric fields, either generated by a Tesla coil or a Van de Graaff generator. And um, he, I think it was 1981, 1982, he was brought in and uh, it was his work and the connection to John Hutchison um, that made me think that this could be something that we, uh, that could explain all of Lena. And uh, I then was trying to, I was actually in California, I had, it was um, uh, early 2017. And I was presenting at the Stanford Research uh, Energy Club the work that's going on within our organization and in Europe. And I was talking about the importance of ball lightning and, and Tesla's uh, carbon button um, lamp and a, a number of different uh, open research that was going on around the world. And uh, I kind of sounded out my colleagues uh, that were we were about to go in there about the... Um, the belief that I uh, between Ken Shoulders and John Hutchison you had an explanation for Lena and I was actually describing the fact that essentially you know you, you, you set up a static field and you put um, you know uh, so for instance microwaves into that uh, static field and this would produce um, uh, the Lena process essentially I, c I could see so many parallels and there was a guy there who'd worked with us called Brian Alverston and he says, oh God, I feel terrible now. I feel absolutely terrible. And I said, what's wrong? Because he kind of almost went white as a sheet. We said, well, I wasn't taking this guy seriously. And there there was this guy that um, uh, called Norris Peary who had approached uh, or they, they had worked together for a little while. So uh, he, he uh, spoke about this guy called Norris Peary and Norris Peary... Um, uh, had this uh, 
company called Peary Research, and he applied for several patents. And essentially what he was doing, he was taking uh, palladium, he was electrostatically loading it with deuterium. He was then putting that into a copper microwave uh, uh, resonant cavity, and he was using a standard magnetron. And in fact, initially, he'd had pulses of electricity and it got faster and faster and higher energy pulses and at some point he realized he couldn't get the electronics to create fast enough pulses and so one of the colleagues he was working with also suggested well can we not just go to a magnetron and so they started using domestic microwave magnetrons much like was used by uh, Dr. Eagley in his uh, ball lightning uh, um, reactors uh, or analogs dusty dusty fusion as he called it and so um, he, he was using this magnetron and he found that even with a two microsecond or millisecond, something like that, two, two something second, I think it was a, no more than a millisecond, let's put it like that, he was uh, um, getting nearly every element in the periodic table. And so, so the point was, as I was saying, you needed the static field and the, the interfering uh, microwaves. And this is literally what had been the observation of Norris Peary. And uh, so to cut a long story short, after my presentation, we went back to do some a replication of the experiment that we'd previously conducted. Uh, and uh, I thought I'd contact uh, Ken Shoulders because he was living in the Bay Area. And when, when I found out, because this is 2017, I found out then that he had died in 2013. And I thought, well, um, that's terrible. Uh, I, I hate it when you miss that opportunity to speak to such a, a luminary in any field. And then I I thought, well, who worked with him? And it turns out that he had worked with um, uh, Earth Tech Texas. And I thought, well, this this is really, really interesting because Earth Tech Texas, when we had a certain event in late, I think it was October also, 2013, we were loading a Chalani, sorry, we were running a Chalani wire experiment and the cell had a, a pressure of three bar. That was its operating pressure. And this had a leak, at, the reactor had a leak and so it was leaking down to atmospheric pressure and we would have to periodically recharge it with hydrogen. And every time we recharged it with hydrogen, the uh, GM320 plus, uh, I think it was, uh, uh, GMC, like little Geiger counter, which was outside of gas in the chamber, outside of the glass of the chamber, and at some distance away through air, would record a two and a half to three times uh, increase in uh, over background a signal that then decayed away and this was really uh, striking so uh, this was reported to me I went down there we replicated it I showed it on film in October 2013 and then a guy called Jean-Paul Barbarian replicated it within a 24-hour period and then many people that were doing Lena research around the world contacted me but one of the people that contacted me was Earth Tech Texas uh, contact the project rather and they said, can we help? And it turns out that it wasn't until then, in, Jan in I think it was maybe January, or late January, uh, or sometime in January um, 2017, that I came to learn that the Earth Tech Texas was set up by one Hal Putoff. And of course, Hal Putoff then had worked with John Hutchison to find the support for him. Uh, and also to get uh, Ken Shoulders involved with that research. And they actually worked together uh, on the exotic vacuum objects, as was um, Ken Shoulders referred to them as eventually, um, uh, for about 10 years. So here I was, um, this organization had approached us because we observed a very specific uh, uh, anomaly, which we could repeat every time when we reloaded with hydrogen and it was replicated. and then four years later or so or three and a half years later or whenever it was um we discovered that the the organization that reached out to us to help us was actually um set up by hal putoff and was connected to ken shoulders so you know ken had died before we actually had that observation but whoever reached out to us recognized the significance and it wasn't until almost that moment that I realized that the, in fact, it was a little bit later even, that I realized that this was um, a, a an exotic vacuum object exploding um, or, or many of them being made and being registered 
uh, as the constant and while it goes through this temperature change when the fresh hydrogen goes in cools it down and raises it and so um and i said but basically this explains all lena and uh, and can i speak to hal uh, or the other person that worked with um uh, ken shoulders uh, about the fact that I think Lena is is caused by something akin to what John Hutchison and Ken Childers were doing. And that's when the communication went dead. And so I thought, that's a, that's a bit odd. And so, you know, they reached out to us and now we're saying it probably is this and, and now they don't want to talk to us. And so what does that mean? What does it mean? I don't know. But it's odd. Um, and so it, it, it then came about that um, I got a chance to speak to uh, Norris Peary. I think it was about a week and a half before I went to um, India. And I um, I was, uh, how should we put this? Uh, I was amazed at what he had to say. And I shared that later in the year Um in on SoundCloud on the MFMP SoundCloud actually on uh, Homer Symbion I think it is um, and I I it was about a week after that that I'm sitting at my um, table in my kitchen in um, in where I live and I'm thinking hold on a minute a little bit of background uh, we had a farm we had a, a campsite at one time and some people would leave cars uh you know when they, they they'd rented a caravan or left a caravan they'd had a caravan for about six months and then they walked off and they left a car um, because the car didn't work or it only had a couple of gears that worked and so they didn't want to have to dispose of it anyway my father was quite liberal and he let us do things with the car and myself and my brothers and a number of them we set light to and burnt so i knew what a car burning looked like uh, I knew that certain things would burn and other things wouldn't. And I'm sitting at my desk, uh, uh, my, my, my dinner table in, in uh, where I live. And I thought to myself, oh, hold on a minute. I, I had in the back of my mind some these cars on 9-11 where they kind of like bit to them and like flopped over and other bits had stayed completely intact. And I thought, well, I know that that doesn't happen. But it does in the Hutchison effect. The metal turns to kind of like a jelly. And I thought, and I'm not going to swear, but I swore to myself thinking, holy, uh, could it be that the 9-11 that was done with the uh, something similar to the Hutchison effect? And I think if it is, then obviously Ken Shoulders concluded that the exotic vacuum objects, which he eventually called them, were akin to natural ball lightning. And if that's the case, then I have all that reference material from uh, Dr. George Eagley. And I'm thinking to myself, well, this means that if this... It, I, I hope this isn't true, because if it is true, I'm going to have to change my presentation in a few days in front of the former and potentially current nuclear authorities in India and a load of students and some other people I don't know who's going to be invited in the room. And I'm just going to have to change my presentation. So I hope it's not true. But if it is true, then there will be round holes in the windows in the glass surrounding ground zero, in the building surrounding. So I actually typed in uh, to Google. So if Google needs to uh, filter this out so no one can uh, uh, search for it again, this is what you need to filter out. Um, I typed in round holes, windows, ground zero, 9-11 or something like that. Um, paraphrasing. And all these images started coming up with these pa glass panes from some of the buildings around ground zero that had round holes in them. And I thought, well, oh, God. Oh no. And I thought th this was this is how it was done. Um and so I then um and, and that's that's it. So I, I was looking at this one image and I'm thinking, holy beep, I'm gonna have to change my presentation. It's going to destroy my credibility in the field. But I don't care because I have no choice if I want to maintain my integrity. And that is everything to me. It's everything to me. And so I I looked 
at the bottom of this image, it had this name, Dr. Judy Wood. I thought, who that is Judy Wood? So I started looking up at Judy Wood, and it's like, she's got all these pages on 9-11. And I thought, oh. I said, yeah, but she, she doesn't know it's related to cold fusion. And then she's got some commentary about that. I said, yeah, but she doesn't know that it's John Hutchison and Ken Shoulders. And then she's got whole pages to do with that. So I had come from trying to clear the name of uh, um, Stanley Pons and Martin Fleischmann. And after four and a half years, I'd concluded that 9-11 was done with the same technology that underpins the research of Ken Shoulders and the observations of John Hutchison, and that it was the same thing as cold fusion. And she had come from her observations on the day, and from seven and a half years of research, she came to the same conclusion that I had come to from the completely opposite direction. I didn't want to know that. She wanted to know what the, the, what the um, facts on the day were pointing to. I didn't want to know that this was the case, but it, it, it's just, it is the only logical conclusion. And then it was later that I found out that it was uh, the same Stephen E. Jones, who is known to be a Department of Energy and uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory contractor who destroyed the careers of Martin Fleischmann and Stanley Pons effectively by putting up his hand and, and, and leading the pack, uh, the six out of seven or five out of six of people that voted by committee to say this wasn't science. It's the same Stephen E. Jones that before I discovered what I discovered on that uh, late February 2017 day, it's the same Stephen E. Jones that started to brief against uh, um, Judy Wood. Now, why? Why? We, we have a confluence, a, a, a meeting of unimaginable coincidence, which cannot be coincidence. It has to be that, I don't know, I, I've, I've said this to other people a, a number of times, it must be that they ran out of people that understood enough about the technology in order to prevent the discovery of the technology. And it was then... You know, I, I already knew bef before this point that two years or so before um, uh, they announced in 1989, uh, Stanley Pons and Martin Fleischmann, the whole uh, announcement at Utah, a number of years before that, they, they had had like one cc of palladium and they'd been loading it for something like three weeks and I think Pons went in or something and and turned down the pressure, the electrostatic pressure, the voltage that was driving the the, uh, the loading of the palladium with the deuterium ions, um, because nothing was really happening. Uh, and when you understand it, that means you, you're taking the pressure away, you get diffusion, that causes cracks, the cracks cause charge separation, that produces some ball lightning effectively, or micro ball lightning. But anyway, that aside, they came in after a period of time, uh, like after the weekend or whatever, and... The apparatus, the water had gone, the apparatus was like heavily damaged. It had gone through the fume uh, cupboard, uh, um, mica, uh, whatever it was. And depending on who you hear the story from, it's up to a fist sized uh, area of concrete on the floor had been vaporized. And the air in the laboratory was had a fine suspension of dust particles. And if that's the case, they they for them to be there for a long period of time, the part, dust particles have to be so light that, that they're able to be able to be moved around by Brownian motion, which means they are very, very small particles. And so here you have a situation. Yes, well, not necessarily lighter than the air, but the, the kin kinetic motion of, of the gas particles moving around is, is enough to keep them lofted, as it were. And they might be lighter than the air. That, that's another story. But and they might have a lot of gaseous components in them and that that certainly my understanding now is that that will be the case but you you have this well the, the, the point is about that is that they observed dustification two years before their announcement in 1989 and there is a interview in Infinite Energy from 1996 between the interviewee, interviewer, Christopher P. Tinsley, 
and uh, um, Martin Fleischmann, where Martin Fleischmann admits that at the time they were studying cold fusion, they were studying four properties, one of which was cold fusion. Another one was uh, the behavior of electrons in metals, something else I can't remember. And then in that three-page interview, there, Christopher P. Tinsley raises this subject of anti-gravity. And during that uh, segment, it's the only segment where you have Martin Fleischmann commenting twice with a dot, 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 and no Christopher P. P. Tinsley in, 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 interlaced. And it looks like a section of the commentary has been edited out. And so uh, these, uh, so effectively one of it's like superconductivity. And when you look at what the, the four different things that they were likely to have been talking about, those are exactly the four things that are in the Salvatore Pai patents that were released in 2019. It is 100% like like uh, propulsion that would work in water or air, high-speed propulsion, um, uh, uh, fusion, uh, uh, superconductivity at room temperature, uh, and, and destruction of matter, those kind of things. You, th th those are like, so for instance, they, they, in one part of the patent, they say, you know, if we, we, if we arrange uh, four of these uh, high-frequency gravitational wave generators, the cardinal points around a planet uh, or planetoid, uh, and using very little power, we can turn the whole thing to dust uh, by, um, and so like, <laughs> and we can also do it for incoming asteroids. And by the way, in a subsequent paragraph, it might even be the next paragraph, we can use this same technology to do fusion. And so the Salvatore Pi, Pi patents combined with what happened with Pons and Fleischmann, like for me, it isn't the fact that they were showing uh, fusion. It's the fact that anyone that attempted to replicate them, if they worked hard enough, they will end up seeing destruction of matter. And then they will ask themselves, why is this occurring? And if they go down that route, they will understand that it is the same technology as ball lightning, that it's a natural phenomena, and it can destroy matter entirely. Well, um, you know, just referencing back to, to what you said about the holes and windows, that's on... Uh... 383, page 383 of Where Did the Towers Go? Uh, she In her chapter, uh, The Tesla Hutchison Effect, uh, uh, chapter 17, she says, uh, Hutchison also describes the creation of round holes in glass during his experiments. The physical process that we are considering here can be compared to the dimensional changes that thermal expansion can bring about. Although the, the Tesla Hutchison Effect case uh the dimensional change is not necessarily heat induced but consider how water expands when it freezes explaining why a full and sealed beverage can will rupture or explode if left in the freezer it, 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 i find it very interesting because uh dr judy woods um D dr judy woods uh first uh initial research was in uh thermal expansion and so this this topic that brought you to uh, look into 9-11 was actually uh, her initial uh, work in, in physics, or at least, uh, uh, you know, I don't know her entire career, but I, I'm aware that those were among her early papers. Um, and so continuing with that thought, uh, you were able to make a connection uh, between Ken Shoulders, uh, which I, I don't think you've mentioned it yet, but his work on EVOs, which uh, I think is comparable to what you were saying is micro ball lightning, is that correct? No, I mentioned EVOs. I called it EVOs. But originally he called them uh, uh, EVs, which uh, basically it's a Latin word, but skip the Latin. It means strong electron. He then realized that they could capture and transport ions. So he called them charge clusters. And because they were very, very high density, he then called it high density charge clusters. So HDCCs. And then he realized that they were doing more than just transporting ions and uh, an agglomeration of, uh, of electrons. He realized that it was doing much more interesting things things and uh, it was effectively changing the vacuum state and so he called it exotic vacuum objects and then he realized or probably a long time before that um, just just from looking at John Hutchison's work that the, these were equivalent to ball lightning and it's not something that people have not been trying to find out how it works people have been trying to work out how ball lightning works for hundreds of years and um, I recently referenced a, a US Air Force funded uh, paper by one Roth 
uh, in uh, it was submitted in December 1993 to Fusion Technology and this was about the time that a, re a Japanese researcher called Taka Akimatsumoto uh, from Hokkaido University was starting to um, come to terms with the fact that, that Lena was probably caused by uh, something akin to ball lightning. He originally called it itonic clusters, but he, he, he then said this is pretty much micro ball lightning. At the same time as the Roth US Air Force paper was being considered for publication in fusion technology, um, so th they submitted it in December 2000, uh, uh, sorry, 1993. In 1994, they changed the rules in fusion technology, the American Nuclear Society's journal that was publishing fu uh, cold fusion work. In 1994, they changed the rules so uh, um, Matsumoto's work could not continue to be published in the journal. And then in May 1995, uh, they published this uh, U.S. Air Force Roth paper, which talks about the fact that um, ball lightning is natural. Uh, it, if we can uh, um, harness it, and uh, some ball lightning is typically like 10 millimeters across, we can produce compact fusion devices and so forth. So you had this weird transition between the realization of Takaki Matsumoto uh, uh, and this overlay between taking taking his work out of the the journal and and the US Air Force funded work by Roth stepping in and th they were talking about work that was going back to uh, many many years and uh, uh, they, they had a very big part on um, uh, the a guy called Paul Collock who came up with a concept called the plasmac for the structure of ball lightning. They said that this is probably the most plausible structure we have so far. And that his work was from 1973. So uh, this is pre-Hutchison. So the fact that, um, you know, uh, Tesla was known to have been a person to generate uh, ball lightning, uh, it is, in my view, um, absolutely certain that uh, uh, the militaries of the world were very aware of this. And in, I think it was October um, 2001, a short time after what I call the event, um, uh, a, a US Air Force, I think it was US Air Force uh, w um, work was commissioned to find out anyone in the world that knew about ball lightning and related technologies. And that was car carried out by a colleague of Hal Puthoff's. Um, uh, uh, and I, um, I can't remember his name just now, but uh, you can go to the Black Vault and find this work. And it was on ball lightning. Uh, and it, he, his organization was called Warp Drive Metrics. And it goes through a whole series of papers and, and research projects around the world that touch on the subject of ball lightning. But in, the, in its conclusion, it says that there are two avenues to pursue. One is the exotic vacuum object work of Ken Shoulders, and it shows where you can find out how to pursue that research. And the other one is US Air Force work conducted between the 1950s and 1960s, which is classified, and it remains classified in that report, but if you look at the classification code, that classification code says that this is classified under space and aerospace technologies. Wow. So does that uh, maybe suggest that there's uh, that, uh, you know, the, these companies such as SAIC and uh, um, others that are involved in space and aerospace are. I don't know about SA SAIC other than the fact that they were meant to do the uh, security uh, after the event um and that in the 1990s well, i guess my I believe, point is that it, it sounds like a defense this sounds like part of defense contractors correct i was led to believe that stanley ponds left the us because someone came to his house and held a gun to his head now why would you do that if you've just had a failed energy project what why would someone do that you know, it's kind of like you, you, you did a fraud on a game, on an energy project. Well, you wouldn't do that. OK, so um, it, if if you put all the pieces together and all of the diversionary tactics and we as a project, the MFMP and our members have been um, uh, attempts have been made to compromise us, divert us, uh, uh, flatter us, uh, um, all kinds of things. 
uh, in uh, that is a, a whole book in itself in the, the ways that were, were attempted to um, disable our project. I mean, uh, early on, we were we were offered unlimited resources at a U.S. military institution, but from our founding, we were told by one of our original founders that if you find anything in the U.S then it can just be locked up and you'll never be able to see it again on pain of death um, by using the security laws. And so that's why the, the, the organization was set up as an international uh, research project uh, to prevent us from having things that were effectively invented in the US. Uh, but this military outfit, they, they offered us on, on, the, on the agreement that we could use any of their equipment, but it, you know we were never to be able to say that we use their equipment. Now, this same military organization, uh, um, we, we turned them down, by the way. <laughs> We're not going to sign an NDA that, that is anything close to that kind of relationship. But we already had this warning from someone that, that, that knew how things these things worked, um, that, that we would be setting ourselves up to walk through a one-way door uh, and if we ever created anything of any use, it would it would never be see the light of day. Um, so, but that we were told by the same organisation later that um, uh, essentially um, they thought that the only way that this technology would ever see the light of day is through an open project such as the MFMP. Right. Well, um, so did you? Uh, what was your? Um initial realization that uh evos uh because it, it sounds to me like you were familiar with ken shoulders separately from the hutchison effect uh through your uh, research into low energy nuclear reactions so so i i i, I came from I, I came from uh see witnessing ball lightning no one no one at the cold fusion conferences was ever talking about ken shoulders i never heard it from anyone at the cold fusion conferences but as I started to research into ball lightning, there was some discussion about Ken Shoulders. And then I came from Ken Shoulders to John Hutchison and, and being interested in uh, 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 kind of interesting things. Uh, I had in the back of my mind some things that I'd seen with John Hutchison in the past. And then th there was a convergence of those uh, things between visiting Dr. George Eagley in, in October 2016 and January 2000. Uh, and 17 before giving the presentation at the Stanford Energy uh, Club, um, uh, I, I realized that these these things could explain Lena as much as I'd understood at that point. Now, my learning since then has gone so much further in, in that th these technologies produce what Dirac predicted in 1932, which are monopoles. Um, uh, they're not pure monopoles, they are pseudo monopoles, but they're monopole uh, action nonetheless and that they can cluster and it was only much later after i realized that and even after i published that 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 i i was told that the conclusion of ken shoulders ken uh, 1986 book which was previously uh, uh, secret but is now in the public domain um saying that the exotic vacuum objects are oscillating monopoles and so you know and like ball lightning what, what book is that, by the way? Uh, it's called evie a tale of discovery evie a tale of discovery by Ken Shoulders, and it's a 1986. Oh, and if you I'm go to the, Ma I didn't mean to cut you off. Listen. That's okay. If you go to Martin Fleischmann Memorial uh, Project, uh, uh, um, you um, Facebook, and you look uh, for Ken Shoulders or EV A Tale of Discovery, you'll be able to find a link to download uh, uh, a PDF of that book. And by the way, I've not read it. <laughs> the conclusion that I'm talking about, I read about on Rex Research's comments about I I Evos. So I, I deliberately not read his book because I like to clean room my research. I, I, I like to find out from nature how things work and then see if anyone's observed it in the past. Right. And, and it seems... That's my view on research for me personally. Uh, yeah, and, and it seems that uh, that's taken you a long way. Um, so would you like to talk about uh, what you've been working on recently? I, I remember seeing a video very recently about crop circles from you, and that, that one really caught my, my interest. Uh, I think uh, you were talking about uh, microspheres there um, of some kind. Yeah, so, yeah, so essentially... Uh, 
<laughs> on my wedding ring that you ha you see here. You can't see it, but I, I have the uh, response to the Arecibo telescope on here, the crop circle there, because it has a, a Ra in the centre and it has a fractal Ra structure uh, uh, as their communication method that they returned the message at the Chilbolton Observatory. And interestingly, uh, that was in 2001. <laughs> <laughs> and the, 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 they had like one in 2000 I think what year? It, it was in 2000 and then in 2001 uh, it was it was uh, in August 2001 they had the reply and then I think the following year they had the classic one where it's got the alien with, with the CD with the ASCII codes and that that is saying basically beware of those that are, uh, are deceiving you um, there's still time uh, the portal is closing type thing um, and uh, so that I have that on my wedding ring, and and the reason I I actually chose gold uh, from Alaska from a single nugget to make both of our wedding rings because um, there's a foundation called the Fondation de Brulier, and uh, they uh, have observed strange radiation tracks uh, on X-rays, which is a form of coherent matter traveling wave, in my view. When they went to up into the North Pole area in the in the tundra region, they, they observed these things on X-rays. And seeing as these things will store themselves in metal indefinitely and are coherent, which means that they are they are connected in a way to all of the other ones. Then um, I believe that a gold piece of gold sitting in Alaska for uh, millions of years uh, will have a lot of coherent matter in it and so I wanted to make our rings out of that single piece of gold um, so that was my first uh, crop circle uh, interaction really um, uh, because I realized that, th that this is a model for coherent matter and uh, if you go and look at my um, Sochi 2018 impression, uh, presentation to the Russian cold nuclear transmutation and ball lightning community which has been calling that for 25 years 27 years now i think um uh which are the low energy nuclear reaction researchers of the russian federation uh, i gave that presentation in Ru russia that was my ending slide that i was giving there in at, at the end of 2000 uh, october the 5th 6th or something uh 2018 the other uh, uh, um crop circle that you're referring to uh, came about in, in the discussion because uh, I had shared uh, a very large number of videos and, and we've developed this uh, uh, experiment using these uh, domestic ultrasonic cleaners and I proposed this. Uh, Alan Goldwater wanted to clean a sample that I'd uh, um, made, uh, sorry, a control sample from a, a experiment that, uh, uh, sample that uh, I conducted in 2019 in Japan using a Mars gas and he wanted the control sample to, he wanted to clean it and so he had this ultrasonic cleaner so he put it in here and uh, he gave me the clean sample after being in there for like 180 seconds or something and uh, I put it under the SEM and it had these three huge explosion craters and I said Alan you might want to come and see this <laughs> And it was showing a uh, uh, resonant, uh, far from uh, uh, um, sort of stability, uh, 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 far from equilibrium uh, explosions. And uh, from that, I proposed a couple, about a week later, a few days later, um, that people use these to do experiments. And since then, many people around the world have taken aluminium foil, aluminium foil for those in the States, and they put them in here. And we have an ex uh, the experiment protocol on our website and what it produces are these figures of eight now um i've seen these in the mars gas plates and i've seen these actually when you have two uh, you have a, a, an ultrasonic horn and a plate above and you put water droplets in between between you get two spots as well the same kind of thing but in 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 the resonant nodes this way you also get two spots that way um and uh, um uh when you look at these under the microscope, uh, under the scanning electron microscope, you see that there is a vortical structure in both of these things. A toroidal bubble forms in there, which is cavitating at the same time in sympathy with the sound. And that this synthesizes matter at the core of it. And uh, the experiment um, review was the i'd only run like two of these experiments many other people have run them now but the one i actually show on the demonstration video of how to conduct these experiments 
is the same file that I took to the CITEC, the Central European Information and Technology Center or Exchange Center or something up the road here. And I, I put it under their um, uh, wonderful T-scan, scanning electron microscope, and chose a selection of these figure of eight structures, which, uh, um, uh, by the way, uh, are, you know, that, that one one's a cone and one's a trough, but the, the trough is the same shape as the cone, just like uh, 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 sort of mirrored, but uh, and offset. Um, this it, under there, you see, depending on the level life, uh, how long it's been doing this spinning, you you see a range of elements, and we we seem to have synthesized everything from boron through to silver uh, from water and aluminium. Obviously, that it's tap water, so there's going to be contamination in there. So when you say synthesizing matter, um, that's where I. Um... I'm not entirely sure what you mean. I uh, would you would you mind elaborating on that? Yeah. So uh, th there's th I, I I've started to allude to this, and I, I will do it in more detail. But uh, all throughout the cosmos, there is uh, uh, relic neutrinos, and I think there's something like 2.6 or 2.4 kelvins. They're all basically at the same temperature, so they're all ready to be cohered. They don't normally interact with matter, but um, these exotic vacuum objects appear to cohere them. That is to bring them to, uh, in, focus them, and, and, and condense them. And so you're taking a matter that normally uh, rarely interacts with matter, and you're condensing it into matter that you can physically use. So this is this is matter creation, um, and in the in this process, it can also gather other. Uh, nucleons in this coherent state and when when you get ball lightning the it, as far as I understand it the inner sheath of the ball lightning um, effectively you've got a pressure pushing out for whatever reason we don't need to go into that and you've got the uh, ions and electrons coming in and it, it has this kind of equilibrium point which is at the inside of the double layer and as that gets more and more let's say electrons they, they are um, forced to rearrange themselves to the point where they have no more space to rearrange themselves. And then they can start forming uh, effectively one uh, coherent piece of matter. Like it, um, it, 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 there's a patent called method, uh, methods and, uh, uh, or what, what is it called? Uh, something like methods for creating coherent matter. Uh, beams uh, by Lockheed Martin. It was submitted in 2011 and it was awarded in 2013. Um, and they are effectively using a Ken Shoulders. So spot. is this... Sorry? Is this comparable to uh, when Dr. Judy Wood talks about uh, molecular dissociation? So... Uh, Where she talks about... Uh, she gives the analogy of musical chairs and she says that that um, the matter is, is so, sort of dancing and then, and then it, it gets to sit but not all of them get to sit correctly so is it is this sort of the coherent uh component to that um no i think she's talking uh, about mixing things up you're, you're mixing it all up and when you stop the music i.e you stop driving the coherent process and the co coherent state collapses then you end up with whatever it state it was in so so for instance if, if you keep feeding a coherent matter structure uh, it'll it'll go through the periodic table and it'll even go well beyond the periodic table and 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 in the case of SV Adamenko, uh, who from the early two thousands uh, had about six hundred man years of research conducted in the old um, uh, isotopic factory uh, outside of Kiev in Ukraine. Um, he uh, used an electric discharge of about one tenth of the speed of light um, into uh, a metal target. Uh, uh, with about 300 joules of energy and whatever element you started with you ended up with pretty much every element in the periodic table and he calls it a, a, um, what is it an electronuclear condensate or whatever an electronuclear no, an electron nucleus cl electron nuclear cluster um, and this basically loses its all identity uh, uh, and, and then it kind of blows out and then you get all these blobs and the, typically the blobs are rich or pure or one element and so the only way that can be is if this is coherent to a certain level of uh, intensity uh, of energy intensity and then when it when it comes back into our normal matter space um, it becomes one element 
And so he saw every element in the periodic table and all the way up to elements that were at least 455 AMU. And so uh, these are things way outside of the Mendeleev table and not existent normally in our near universe. Um, and uh, that, that actual lab, from the, the, the equipment from that Proton 21 lab went to America and is now, as I understand it, at Brookhaven National Laboratory uh, attempting to create practical fusion. And so, uh, you know, and there's a, you can go and buy the book even on Amazon. It's called uh, um, something Methods for Nucleosynthesis or something. Just look at S.V. Adamenko. It's about 760 pages and, and it's not cheap, even as a digital form, I have it. Uh, it's not cheap, but it's well worth a read. Uh, and in there he talks about I think 10,000 or at least a thousand times energy gain with all the different matter that comes out uh, um, but um, so what you're doing is you're denaturing the nucleons uh, from uh, and, uh, the nuclei rather from being what they were before to a state where depending on uh, um, uh, how you control it you can end up with another particular uh, uh, material. Now, this guy I mentioned earlier called Takaaki Matsumoto, a nuclear scientist uh, from Hokkaido University, he's retired now, uh, I think he's 80, 81, um, he found that um, in his description in his um, uh, book, uh, which uh, he produced in 1999, it, he said that uh, far in the universe, uh, you know, you get stars that die and they have a nuclear collapse, produce neutron, neutron stars and you get supernova and so forth. Um, uh, and he says since that the um, long range force of uh, 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 the electric force is 40 orders of magnitude stronger than the gravitational force, uh, it should be easy to reproduce that uh, kind of process in the lab using electric force. And in fact, uh, he says that, that that wasn't possible to do uh, until now, and it's been shown. And he calls them electronuclear reactions. And there, there are several classes. Some of them can be uh, normal transmutations or fusions or fissions. Uh, but if you drive the process very hard, he gets what you call electronuclear collapse, electro uh, ENCs. And this collapses the material, uh, and you can, you can have it... Uh, uh, some of it can come out as mesons and the mesons can cause other nuclear reactions in other surrounding material or you you can get light and leptons coming out uh, and uh, leptons being uh, 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 charged or uncharged uh, leptons so an uncharged lepton would be uh, a, a muon neutrino or a neutrino uh, a charged lepton would be a muon or, or, or uh, an electron for instance uh, and light, of course, and they're just photons that are coming out. So you're effectively um, converting baryonic matter into matter that doesn't exist that we can physically use other than the light that comes out. We could use it to synthesize or, or cause spillover to create electrons in a solar panel, or you could directly use the electrons. But once they're lost, the, the, you know, the actual solid dense matter that you're looking at um, is is removed now conversely you can feed it electrons you can feed it leptons uh, that are not charged and that's what i'm talking about these relic neutrinos from the cosmos which are flooding us all the time not not the relativistic neutrinos that come from the sun i'm talking about relic neutrinos relic neutrinos you can you can condense those and so you can actually synthesize more matter um, and the part of electronuclear collapse is it goes into something akin to a black hole, but it isn't. And then there is a wormhole and then somewhere else it spews out the matter and uh, it's a vortical structure. Uh, and the uh, on the outside, you get light elements like carbon, uh, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, maybe silicon. And in the, in the center, you get the heavier elements like iron and so forth. And uh, we've observed all of these phenomena before I was even aware of what Takaaki Matsumoto had done his research. I, I became aware during the Sochi conference because it was mentioned, I think, by one of the, the Russian researchers. And I thought, oh, I, I better see if I can look into that guy's work. And I'd already published pictures that were either SEMs or, or uh, uh, optical microscopy or uh, macro photography that were showing exactly the same phenomena as he had observed and published previously. And then it wasn't until August uh, last year that I came across a guy called, uh, uh, I think it's uh, Solin, a Russian, 
and in 1992 he had submitted a patent application for a quantum coherent nuclear reactor and in that reactor he had also described exactly the process that I'd come to realize and published previously in, 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 in the year about how when you get coherence um, between electrons and he describes he has like a, a zirconium uh, uh, chamber and he fires uh, it can be zirconium it can be molybdenum it can be uh, um, uh, tungsten anything that's got a high melting point and a hot, low vapor pressure and and you fire he had an electron beam uh, furnace that went into this material and it melts it out to a point but you, you because of the low vapor pressure and the high melting point you get what's called electron bunching electron bunching is known to lead to coherence of electrons what is coherence of electrons that's when the electrons um, uh, are in phase and at the same energy so they can form Cooper pairs and then Cooper pairs can cluster into condensates and this he says in his patent uh, which was awarded in 1996 and is now free for anyone to use. The, the, uh, um, uh, the coherent electrons form automatically into two types of solitons and these are like donuts, you can think of them as donuts and the sol solitons express uh, uh, two types of magnetic charge. Well, what would that be? Well, that would be north and south. So he's talking about pseudo-magnetic monopoles and he says that these things can then cluster together and they can form aggregates that then can cause uh, baryonic and proton uh, decay and he specifies uh, the decay of protons because it call, re, it produces the unification of the forces that is the electric the magnetic and the gravitational forces are unified and so you have a situation that is hypothesized to have occurred at the beginning of the universe what the implications of this are is that you do not need a big bang you do not need supernovas you do not need any of these things to create all the elements we see on our crust and in our earth they can be created locally by the electromagnetic force that's incredible and uh and it seems that um you know this flies in the face of, of much of what we're taught in mainstream science uh it seems that actually mu much of your research i don't think you're allowed uh, to be taught this much of your research, uh... <laughs> so so when I, when i'm when i'm referring to that you're talked about to get back to the crop circles um a long time after, so if you go to remoteview.icu, I, I published a whole series of things on, on these, what I call ULTR, ultra experiments, um, from both myself and from third parties that were conducting the replications of these experiments. And they were basically instantaneously getting results. It's probably the most satisfying scientific experiment you can do because you, 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 you can do it probably from the age of three upwards. Um, it takes you only about 20 minutes to learn. It's fun. Uh, and you're doing nuclear transmutation. So what's, what's, what's not good about that? And effectively, you're just using sound and it's very cheap. Do you have a, uh, the title of the video uh, so that uh, my audience can watch it? Because I think this, this should be uh, spread far and wide. Yeah, I, I haven't so... seen the video that you're talking about. So let, let, me, let me just, so uh, if you go to uh, the, uh, the YouTube, <laughs> Uh, and you type in, uh, I'm going to kill my audio on my computer here. You type in MFMP into search. Just put MFMP ULTR, probably. That'll be what you need. And so you'll see a number of different experiments for the ultra experiment. And if you go down, uh, I don't know. I'm doing what I think you should be doing. And hopefully it will find it. No, it's not found it yet. Oh dear. Getting there. No, maybe not. Oh, yeah. So it's called Ultra ULTR dash experiment how to 4K. And so it's it's just 23 minutes. You can watch it even on double time and it shows you doing the experiments. And the actual sample that I produced in that experiment is the sample that I analyzed in ULTR dash crop circles. Which is where we are talking about this crop circle. And uh, what it was was some time after doing that experiment uh, and uh, I, I someone sent a video about some aliens and la 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 and so I thought oh, okay I'll have a look at this and I watched it on double time and, I, and so I was scrolling through and I thought that crop circle that crop circle looks like 
looks like the structures that we see forming on the aluminium foil or copper foil or whatever you want to put in there. Um, and and so I, when I took the S scanning electron microscopy and I overlaid the crop circle, it's an absolute 100% match. And it even includes on the more detailed part of it, something that indicates the crushing, the coherence, and the, the bubble that does the job, um, uh, which I'd already recorded. Uh, and this bubble, when you turn off the sound, it ha has this toroidal bubble, which comes out and then forms into a spherical bubble. Um, and, uh, you know, this was probably from, I think it was from, uh, 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 a guy, um, uh, let, let me know that this is uh, from, I think, the 1990s or something, uh, 1996 or something. So someone was trying to tell the world how to create coherent matter I I at that time. And uh, so, you know, I I've been very, very careful to not say I'm discovering anything. I just think I'm making a realization. It's very clear to me that this technology was used uh, abundantly and because it's it's a fundamental part of how nature works, you would only have to bother to study nature long enough uh, to find out how this technology works. Um, uh, you know, you just as, as long as you're not distracted until you die, uh, and you paid paid attention to what nature did, then you would always discover this. It didn't matter where you were in the universe. So just just to repeat, it is the ULTR experiment how to 4K. That's the video. Yeah, so if you if you go to um, the ultra crop circles uh, uh, entry on remoteview.icu, there is a, um, a a person who has found a, an exact equivalent of this on Amazon in the U.S. and uh, it was thirty dollars. So uh, you can get it. Then you just need some of uh, some kitchen foil. And, and then what, what they call a, a cake box lid. So this is a cake box from a CD stack. And uh, I show how you put the foil on there. And the purpose of this is it holds it in the ultrasonic tank and prevents it moving around. And that means that any resonant nodes that form, they stay where they are. And so you're driving the resonance and driving the resonance and adding energy. So just to clarify... You're, you're doing what Tesla did with his earthquake generator. Oh, very interesting. Um, so just to clarify, um, that machine that you showed, uh, I'm not sure what you called it, but how, where, where exactly would I buy that? Uh, you can get one on Amazon. Uh, I think it's about $30, less less than $30. You've probably got delivery on top of that. I don't know. What was the name of that uh, uh, device? Uh, well, this one's called Vivreal, but it was just a brand name for it. But it looks like a, almost an identical one that this, this uh, girl has found. So uh, if, you, if you go to remoteview.icu, I can go there now, actually. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm actually on the page. Okay, I see ULTR crop circles. Now, do and and I'm guessing you've had a number of successful replicators. Oh, it works every time. <laughs> so the the other thing is is that um, using this uh, and now, if you go through the remote view to ICU threads on Ultra, you will see that um, some guy in Japan, uh, Peter, he I think it's Peter. Uh, sorry if it's not Peter. Um, he, he replicated this. He did some high-speed photography. I took some high-speed photography and color uh, microscopy uh, and, and so on. So we characterized it quite well, what was going on. And then uh, um, it was a thing that I wanted to do, but uh, our guy, Dave uh, Boutlier in Canada, he bought a, an ultrasonic tanker. He had one lying around. He, he had a go with it. And um, he decided to put a magnet in there, a neodymium magnet wrapped in something, and he picked up a couple of these uh, uh, pieces of aluminium that were now a magnetic, which was interesting. And he put them under the microscope, and you could see this like vortical structure out of the tip. And it was the tips of these cones that had become magnetic. So I said, well, that's very interesting. Based on all my research, I expect we'll find crenellated iron-rich uh, microspheres, uh, iron oxide uh, microspheres in there. So I asked Alan, who did the original cleaning of the indium foil, uh, where where this process was discovered under, under when I was looking under the microscope. I said, Alan, you you've got this device. You've got a scanning electron microscope in the, in the next door. I predict that if you run this 
uh, for a little bit longer, uh, uh, you will see the production of iron-rich crenellated microspheres uh, because it's producing, in my view, coherent matter and it's fusing the, the aluminium. So you take 227 aluminium, you get to iron 54 or whatever it is. Uh, or it's doing some combination of, uh, uh, of fusing of the nucleons. And so um, uh, he said, OK, so rather than running it for 160 seconds or 180 seconds or whatever I did uh, for the stuff that you see on ultra crop circles, uh, he ran it for a, the maximum of 480 or it might have even been 402, 480, 960 seconds before he took he took his uh, magnet and ran it around. And you know what he found? Several of these iron-rich crenellated microspheres. That's very incredible. And, and you know, just to draw the correlation uh, throughout this conversation, uh, we, uh, we see iron-rich microspheres in crop circles. We saw iron-rich microspheres on 9-11. And, um, you know, it just so happens that 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 guy, Stephen E. Jones, you brought up, uh, he used the iron, the, the iron rich microspheres to suggest that thermite was responsible for turning seven World Trade Center buildings into dust. And uh, that is um, a, a, abysmally wrong. It's it's not it's counter to the evidence. But what we can see clearly here is a uh, direct correlation between low energy nuclear reactions, the Hutchison effect, 9-11, uh, and, uh, and even crop circles, which, uh, which many of those things... Well, 100%. And then to close, close it out, I, on, 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 on the 20th anniversary, I laid out my case in a video called My Movie XX Years On, and... Uh, subsequent to that uh, movie, uh, that interview with Andrew Johnson, um, who I revealed several things that I'd not discussed before, I had a scanning electron microscopy session uh, looking at uh, a, sub a sample that was produced by a collaborator called Hank Uren in Holland. And this is where we are taking brass a brass sheet with two brass sheets above producing a gap and the gap then allows for electron bunching and we have a corona discharge and this produced in my view a magnetic electron condensate a fluidized electron ken shoulders called them and this bled out into channels and this is effectively ball lightning but it's ball lightning that's wetting together like 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 uh, like something with a surface tension and you see this in our other, uh, what we call Vega experiments. And uh, in the previous microscope session, I'd found something that was behaving extremely oddly. It was, um, it was very, very bright in the field of view, and it was almost sucking the electrons from the environment around it. And so I thought that this could be, because of where it was placed in one of the uh, channels uh, from the previously uh, channels that I believe were created by this highly magnetic fluidized uh, electron condensate and um, it, it was leaving this structure uh, uh, and I wanted to have a closer look at it so the first thing we did when we got on a microscope and looked at this and when we went in we found out that it was FeO2 it was an iron crenellated microsphere now why is FeO2 interesting well unlike the uh, ultra experiments and other experiments where we have synthesized these crenellated microspheres because we also synthesize synthesized the crenellated microspheres in the nova experiments which were ball lightning synthesized using the dusty plasma technology of a reactor built and designed by dr george eagley we'd already shared that in 2017 uh, we find these iron rich and uh, magnetic crenellated microspheres we'd already seen it in me 56 356 experiments where he's got potassium carbonate in an alumina that's aluminium oxide cylinder with uh, light water and tungsten electrodes he's synthesizing these crenellated microspheres in our case in this experiment this is feo2 it's not fe203 this is feo2 now why is that significant it's significant because it was predicted uh, to occur and then synthesized for the first time in 2016 and published in Nature. It's a higher oxidation state than the magnetite Fe203. And it's only expected... Do you remember who predicted that? Or, or how that... It, it came about, it was a Chinese group and they, they, they synthesized it in a diamond anvil at 76 gigapascals. 
you understand what that is 750,000 atmospheres right and at 1,800 so what that's very high atmospheric pressure that that's very high whatever pressure <laughs> <laughs> it's 700,000. It's like you're living in one atmosphere. If you get into water and you dive down to 10.14 meters, that's two atmospheres. This can only be synthesized above 750,000 atmospheres. And you know what, uh, what? how many atmospheres we had in our Vega experiments? Very, very much less than one atmosphere. So something is crushing what that matter. That it, something is crushing that matter into a sphere that is incredibly, incredibly high pressure. At least 750,000 atmospheres. And you know what it was? It was an iron-rich granulated microsphere. Specifically, the most iron-rich oxide of iron that's ever been discovered. And you can see papers by the, uh, that are on the Department of Energy site from 2019. This is the hot topic in iron oxide research. And some people are speculating there's a patent in Japan, uh, patent application in Japan, where they've created using um, doping of, uh, um, I think, uh, alkaline metals. They've not achieved the iron one atom to two atoms of oxygen. They've achieved more than Fe203, but not FeO2. Um, they are finding that at room temperature, it can split water. Wow. That's that's incredible. And um, I mean, that you know, that's essentially... A, yes. Uh, so I these iron... iron a, go on. Go ahead, I'm sorry. These iron-rich microspheres, these FeO2, I believe, are the magnetic core of um, magnetic monopoles, but specifically the magnetic core, core of bull lightning. And if you go and look at these people, like in Norway or whatever, they go out and collect these iron oxide crenelated microspheres they're calling them micrometeorites i don't think they are i think every single one of those pretty much because you do get them from meteorite uh, um, air bursts but not like these ones these ones which are literally look exactly like the ones that we observed in the uh, ultrasonic experiments and exactly like the ones we observed in the uh, uh, glow discharge experiments under low pressure uh, i believe that all ball lightning synthesizes these things and many of the things that people are associating with uh, micrometeorites are actually the cause of ball lightning now the interesting thing about this is ken shoulders by studying high uh, frame rate uh, uh, videography of my uh, of ball lightning established that what he was observing in the lab with these exotic vacuum objects was exactly the ob observation that you see in um, lightning and the implications are that every single lightning strike or the, the lightning ionization channel, every single one of those has a ball lightning that actually does the ionization of the channel first. And when you split, see them splitting up in the air and going into multiple fingers, each one of those is a little ball lightning. And so every single one of these will produce an iron rich crenelated microsphere. And so these, these things that people are collecting from gutters, thinking they're micrometeorites, no, they are the core, the magnetic core of a ball lightning. This, what I'm telling you now, is so far beyond the cutting edge of where the, the published journals are recording this. And you know what? You can, you can yeah. get the youngest person in your family, probably, to conduct this experiment and produce them in an ultrasonic tank. Wow. Exactly the same looking things. And it, so I, I completely agree with you. This is this is not even cutting edge. This is beyond the cutting edge. Th this is uh, groundbreaking stuff uh, that anybody should be paying attention to. Um, but why do you think that uh, the mainstream science uh, industry is uh, still calling ball lightning a myth, ignoring research such as this? Ignoring <laughs> research such as this. Well, and anyone that's interested in, in using this technology for all of the next generations of weapons, which they are, uh, would not want the general person in the street finding out that you can do this by shouting at some water. Right. So it, it's essentially uh, a, a cover-up uh, based on uh, defense. I, I wouldn't call it a cover-up. You know, it covers up itself. It's so unbelievable that you can synthesize meta just from sound. But it explains so much of the ancient texts. It texts. It explains so much of the ancient architecture. Uh, so you think that it, it takes a, a high expert 
I, I mean, I'm trying to interpret what you're saying. It, it, what I'm gathering from you is that um, it takes a high expertise to really recognize what's happening here, that, that the average person may write it off as, as nothing substantial. Is that you are told that you cannot transmute elements, despite the fact that you have potassium-14 in your body and carbon-14 that are transmuting right now every second for every human that's ever lived, right? right? Okay, and how that's occurring is partly statistical and partly because it doesn't want to be unstable. It doesn't want to be unstable. It wants to be a stable element. And part of that is because of interaction with relic neutrinos from the cosmos. Now, you can focus relic neutrinos, and in fact, Parkamov did, and, and that is in his book Space, Earth, Human. You can go and find out exactly how he discovered that and how and the exact experiments you can do to prove that to yourself and uh, what that means. And he spe specifies exactly the same conclusion I came to, and um, unfortunately, he published it first, but uh, that's just the way that th these things are. Um, he said that potassium-40, which is, I think, 0.02% of all potassium that's in the in your body right now um that that is the fuel of the future why because it's the second most unstable isotope after uranium-235 and if you can con control uh, a flux of uh, relic neutrinos or you can synthesize the equivalent called cold neutrinos from increasing the temperature of solid or dense solid matter or dense plasma to the temperature of in excess of a thousand degrees centigrade you start synthesizing these relic neutrino equivalents cold neutrinos and these can stimulate the inverse beta decay of potassium 40 which will release a 1.551 million electron volt electron which then can ionize a lot of gas and that can then feed a lot of electrons and ions to your ball lightning and what do you have in concrete go and find out how much potassium you have in concrete the fuel is in concrete and then the secondary fuel is nitrogen in the wow. air. If you take two nitrogens and you fuse them, you get one atom of proton, you get a hydrogen nuclei, and you get 27 aluminium, and you get something like 15 point something million electron volts. So you, you have this extremely hot aluminium atom, synthesized and uh, extremely hot. When I say hot, it's not thermal, it's kinetic energy. And that smashes into your iron. That smashes into your iron at very high speed, right? And that raises the temperature of the iron like a few atoms around the impact zone as such that it oxidizes re very readily. And then what you have is extremely hot aluminium, single atoms, right next to extremely hot iron oxide, which is, by the way, thermite. Right. And and so <laughs> maybe I'm, I'm now uh, uh, making, a, making a bit more tangible what you mean by it covers itself up. Uh, Someone like Stephen E. Jones is able to look at this and say it's thermite, and it's not that he's necessarily incorrect. It's that he's he's mislabeling the cause of why we're looking, or why we're seeing um, rust powder with uh, iron oxide. He's not lying. He's not lying. Uh, it is nanothermite. He's not lying. He can look into the camera and know that he's telling the truth. It's just like George Bush saying there are evidence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Yes. They were in the museums. I, 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 I don't know, but we do know that in the interview between him uh, uh, for, um, sorry, his presentation in, in a video for Architects and Engineers for Truth. He's caught on to the camera and he's saying, and you know, this may just be a coincidence, but he's in one breath, he's saying that one of the only organizations that can produce nanothermite is Los Alamos National Laboratory. And he does not disclose that he had been a contractor for Los Alamos National Laboratory, which you should do when you're making that statement about one of the only laboratories. He then says, and some people have accused me of spiking the samples. And then he gives a duper smile. It's a classic duper's smile. Go and have a look at the video. Say I'm not saying what he's doing. Now, it might just be that he felt the need to smile at that point. It might be that he felt it was unnecessary to say that he was a contractor for Los Alamos National Laboratory. It might be that by some kind of lawy lawfare, they, they could have a go at me for pointing out those two coincidences. 
But it's a lot of coincidences. It's irrelevant. From my point of view, the event showed that this technology was extremely powerful. And my argument to you or to any listener would be this. If the US uh, Navy is saying that they can use high frequency gravitational waves, right, to destroy a planet and convert it to dust, don't you think it's quite easy to do the same thing to two piddly little 110 story buildings and surrounding buildings? That makes perfect sense to me. It's like they're literally uh, saying we can do this and we can convert it to dust. It, it seems to me that they would rather affirm the macro in place of the micro. They they don't they don't want to uh, affirm what is happening. Right. But but it seems that they don't want us to recognize it, for instance, on 9-11 or in Pons and Fleischmann's experiments or in Tadahiko Mizuno's experiments or in John Hutchison's experiments. They, they don't want us to see it when it's right in front of our eyes, when the evidence is right there. But they tell us, oh, it is possible out there in the planets. And, and it's it's this um, it's this it's this concept where uh, you can never actually um, hold on to the evidence. It's, it's always this thing out there. Someone else knows. You know, the, the adults will figure it out. And it seems that that's what we were given on 9-11. No, 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 no. The children can figure it out. Absolutely. And I, and that's why I had you on. And I absolutely love this conversation. I will say, I think you and I could speak for hours on end. I find what you say uh, immensely interesting. I absolutely appreciate you being on the show. Um, you know, I, I think this is probably a good place to, to wrap up, but I um, I would be uh, I would absolutely be glad to have you back on. Well, uh, sorry, I haven't let you ask me many questions, but from my point of view, um, uh, it's it's a great pleasure to be on your show. Uh, and I hope your listeners get something useful out of what I've said. Um, uh, pe people ask often why there aren't more people viewing the MFMP's work. And, and I say, I like it that way. <laughs> it was a long game. When, when the realization was had in 2017, I came straight out at the most uh, high impact um, opportunity I had as immediately after as I, I, I as immediately as I possibly could to make uh, this realization aware, uh, uh, public to the public. Uh, the reason being is that, that I, I, I needed to know um, who would want to listen uh, from that point onwards and who wouldn't. And uh, I, 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 that because I did that, I learned who are the good actors and who are the bad actors. Uh, it, it was amazing. It was just amazing. Because some people can't even look you in the eye. Yes. And it's, it's because they don't want the association because they, they've got a whole life built around a lie. You know, their technology does this and this is how it works. And it's like, you know that it's not working like that. A hundred percent. It's just not working like that. There are people out there that are claiming that they are using uh, hydrogen and water uh, with metal electrodes, uh, liquid metal electrodes. And I, I, I'd, I'd rather you don't ask me to confirm who it is. Um, but they are claiming... So the death ray by Tesla had a liquid metal electrode or a tungsten wire uh, doing a high intensity discharge into an open-ended vacuum tube which went through dry steam which is water vapor right um, and he calls them electrical particles of matter the shoulders patents from the 1980s had a mercury wetted tungsten electrode discharging into xenon and, and low pressure hydrogen uh, at, you you have these scenarios, and in in every case, they will be producing exotic vacuum objects, which are uh, a technological uh, ball lightning, in my view. And uh, by by the way, they have magnetic monopole uh, uh, nature to them, and they also are effectively coherent matter. Um, and uh, you have the Lockheed Martin. They're honest because they are saying we get a spike electrode and we do a pulse from that across a magnetic field. Well, the magnetic field is what was being used by Bostic 
in the 1950s, what was Bostick charged with from 1949 or 1948 onwards, he was charged with running a couple of labs to convert the H-bomb into domestic fusion. From converting the H-bomb into domestic fusion. What did he do? He had high intensity electrical discharges over a magnetic field. What is the Lockheed Martin coherent matter traveling, uh, co coherent matter wave beams uh, patent uh, saying they're having an electric discharge um, uh, into and over a magnet going through a, a um, some micro cavities to force coherence. Anyway, the point is it's, it's the shoulders patent and uh, th there are those that are using effectively a liquid electrode uh, to discharge in a hydrogen and water rich environment. And the, the water is more, the, the oxygen in the water is what's important because that is highly paramagnetic and that allows the clustering of the uh, cold neutrinos and, and to assist the formation of the bull lightning. And this is exactly what happened above Chernobyl. This is exactly what happened uh, happens in my opinion uh, uh, as part of the process of forming ball lightning and that is why I believe we're getting success with the Viv Real, the, the sorry the ultrasonic tests and when we are using low pressure air which contains moisture uh, in our uh, um, uh, Vega experiments and so what you have is uh, uh, the, the, this group that they are claiming they're not creating ball lightning and they're not creating any transmutations and they have spent more than 100 million dollars and um you know they are on the forefront of, of delivering a technology but it's for me if whether they know it or not it's like the acceptable face of this technology i .e., we're going to pretend it's doing something else even if even if there's another explanation for it it's kind of like you, you can be told an explanation for it and who's going to check? Who is going to check? No one's ever going to check. You could be using the technology for a thousand years and no one would check. They would care that they put 10 watts in and they get a thousand watts out. That's what they would care about. 99.9999999%. And when the inventor is saying that it works like this, you just take because they invented it. So they must know how it works because it works. You know what I'm saying? You're reminding me of uh, the something that I remember about uh, uh, Stephen E. Jones and Pons and Fleischmann that that he dev he at first essentially dismissed their claims of uh, low energy nuclear reactions or at the time it was called cold fusion, and then he came out with his own low energy. Well, nuclear he, I reactions. think it was Stephen E. Jones that gave it that name. I might That's be wrong. No, it right. it wasn't it wasn't You're Fleischmann right. that wanted he, that name. He uh, br brought that name. Came in and then uh, Fleischmann uh, begrudgingly agreed, and then he regretted affirming that later on. Um, and then, uh, but but Stephen E. Jones came out with muon catalyzed fusion, so he came out with his own version of low energy nuclear reactions. Right, but but that's the acceptable form. If you if you look in the field right now, that's the acceptable form of low energy nuclear reactions is muon catalyzed fusion. All else is is anathema. But the funny thing is, you're allowed to accept that from a guy who then can go on and say the buildings were taken down deliberately by nanothermite. Exactly. By, by a material used by the military to burn paper. <laughs> and, and you know what? You know what? There's paper all over New York, but there wasn't any filing cabinets except the one in Ben and Jerry's, which happened to have all its coins fused, which were all different temperature melting point metals, without their embossing on the coins from deforming. Yet, the paper notes were returned to the owner of the shop. Yeah, I mean, somehow, ther thermite is supposed to turn buildings into dust, but, uh, but somehow, oh, the only thing left over is paper when thermite is used to burn paper. That's, that's very interesting. Huh? And, and guess what? And guess what? Paper ignites well below the fusing of any of those metals in that Ben and Jerry's filing cabinet. And the filing cabinet doesn't look like it's melted. It looks like it's been caught up in a highly intense magnetic field and, and crinkled right, it's warped. as the electron bonds have been disrupted. Right. And then and then there's paper they showed a there's file folder paper left over in the only file cabinet found at ground zero. And it's not even singed. It's not even singed. But the, the, the comical one is the one that's in ground zero in the actual museum. And that I think it was uh, Mikovitz or I don't know. It's no, it's uh, I don't know. But I, I, I did a video on it. Some I, I said Inconvenient Truth, um, uh, which was about the Bible um, that was found open at, supposedly 
at the uh, an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, uh, and no right. turn the other the cheek section. Right. Um, the ground zero bible. The ground zero bible. Yeah, and and the the, uh, the 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 photographer is describing it as a bible fused to molten steel. I might be paraphrasing that, but how can that even be possible? Like. It takes 1,370 or 1,270 degrees to even melt the, 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 the lowest kind of temperature of steel. But you, you, paper should have ignited well beyond that point. Well beyond that point. And yet people can go and look at that, that particular artifact. They can hear about the, um, the uh, filing cabinet, the only filing cabinet out of whatever, 45,000 or something. And in their brain, they can still think, they can still think that this was just a, a, a normal collapse. It beggars belief. It just, you know, it just beggars belief. I, I've had people suggest that the Ground Zero Bible, that supposed fusing, first of all, they try to dismiss that it fused. Secondly, they try to say that it fused due to pressure. Um, but... You know, when you look at it, you see uh, what what appears to be uh, melted steel. I mean, of course, it uh, we don't know how it got that way, but it is it is deformed steel, which is curved over the paper. And so so the this that steel, presumably the you know, the the mainstream mechanism we're told that steel does this is through heat. So if we're if we're to assume that that, Heat, that heat caused uh, the steel to go over the paper, then the paper would be burnt. But we do not see burnt paper. In fact, there's no, there's not even singes on the side of the paper. These, these pages, yes, the, the Bible is almost destroyed, but there is leftover unsinged paper next to uh, deformed steel. It's, it's, uh, it defies explanation. So, from my point of view, you just have to look. Yeah, you just have to look at the the filing cabinet, the remaining filing cabinet, and the fact of the, the notes being unburnt inside it. Uh, but it's definitely not crushed. It's like really weirdly deformed. But next to the notes were were coins which have melting points which are well higher than the ignition point of of the paper. But they're all kind of fused together, and they're not crushed together because you can even see the embossing of the actual coin on it. You know, so it's it's not a crushed thing. So that ruins the crushed argument. So you, right. you 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 have that situation where it's just it's just impossible to make those arguments for anyone that can is able to critically think. It's just impossible. And then you have things like this. This is this Hutchison sample here. You know, how does this occur? And it's just it's just one of many many examples. Um, where you you have a, a change and particularly in conductive elements uh so for instance the, the car handles and and alloy wheels and engine blocks of the cars disappeared why because aluminium is disproportionately affected by this why because it has a lower temperature it uh, melting point it has a high electrical and thermal conductivity but thermal is not so important it's the electrical conductivity that means it wants to hand over its electrons then it has this uh, um, beautiful light nuclei that is very keen to fuse with ball lightning technology. And it fuses and the, you, you can convert your aluminium into iron rich crenellated spheres. Uh, you can do it yourself. <laughs> with sound. And the sound is producing coherence. I, I, I know I said this is going to be an hour and we keep going on because this is such a, a thrilling conversation as far as I'm concerned. Um, what why do you think that transmutation is billed to be a myth when it is astoundingly clear, when it has been demonstrated again and again? Why do people continue to dismiss transmutation? Why? B because uh, they think it's too complicated. But isn't it an implication of nuclear fusion anyway? I mean, I, I don't understand what what's the defect. Well, uh, transmutation is um, uh, well, no, transmutation is often nuclear exchange reactions. Um, so if you if because it was even complicated for for, for so if you say Takaaki Matsumoto he came up with what's, what's called the natto model which is where natto is like a dough ball and you ferment it and so he 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 realized very early on i think in 1990 so i've got have i got his book i've got his book over here so um it's in japanese but uh, he's got a bit of english on the front cover here and so uh, he actually has this uh, shockwave here, this ring shockwave that he says. And, and uh, he says, uh, 
Miniband, Gravity Decay of Quad Neutron, discovered on August the 25th, 1990 in nuclear emulsion during cold fusion by Dr. Takaaki Matsumoto. It wasn't until years later, after many experiments, that uh, he realised that actually it was trillions of atoms in structures microns wide, but still within this mesh-like structure that were uh, self-collapsing and simultaneously uh, uh, transmuting. I mean, his most simple experiment is a one millimetre lead uh, wire into uh, um, water, sorry, light water with potassium hydroxide, 200 volts of AC, and uh, I think it's like 80 microsecond pulses, four pulses, or probably not even that much. And he gets these little microspheres of lead. But on the, the north pole of the microsphere, there is a hole, and out of that hole is spraying carbon. So your 204, 206, 7, and 8 uh, uh, nucleons uh, in your lead are being uh, collapsed and synthesizing at least uh, a vast amount of carbon out of it. You literally have this plume, and we've replicated it. And the interesting thing is that he didn't realize at the time that because he was using AC with this electrode in water, he's creating HHO. And the HHO is instantaneously combusting. So this is HHO doing coherent matter, producing ball lightning. It's the same thing as lightning. It's the same thing as ball lightning. It's the same thing going on in that tank. It's the same thing going on in our low air pressure uh, uh, reactor there. It's, it's the same thing he observed. It's so simple. It's, and, and when you understand that th this is how simple it is, Every single geothermal vent, every single, every single steam working its way through cracks, every crash of a wave on a shore which has got aluminium or whatever rich rocks, every stream that has water running down it and producing cavitation bubbles in it, all of these systems are synthesizing the atoms for life and stabilizing it all of the time. A water stream a running water why does life always want to live near running or moving water because it is producing very very small amounts of bioavailable newly synthesized atoms that is absolutely incredible and i think this what what you have your conclusion should be uh echoed around the world uh and i I know that this isn't just your conclusion. This is this is uh, a number of people's conclusions, and uh, and it needs to stop being ignored because this is absolutely important information. We can't be drinking dead water. As soon as it's gone through a person, even and more more so with a young person, if you are drinking recycled water, it is dead water. It's really dead. It's giving you nothing that your body really needs. If you are eating food that has been exposed to uh, uh, the mi a microwave, it destroys these energy structures, in my view, in the food. This is more than just uh, uh, just warming something up. It's destroying the energy structures in there. It's destabilizing them. Wow. Uh, it, it, in my view, if, if, if a bug doesn't want to eat your vegetables, you don't want to be eating them either. I completely agree with that. And uh, so does this... What is what you're saying? I mean, uh, man, I, I keep wanting to wrap, but, but no, this, you just made it even more interesting. Uh, <laughs> can't, can't help myself. Uh, do you, uh, think that this relates directly to Victor Schoberger and perhaps the experiment? hundred percent, hundred percent. He was talking about converging air, uh, energy through a vortex at the center of a vortex. You have something trying to move that way and something trying to move that way. That is removing all degrees of freedom. What does that lead to? It leads to coherence. What does coherence lead to? this technology and and doesn't that also relate to uh i mean I, I hate to be just throwing out keywords here but i i think this also relates to walter russell's uh uh idea of the periodic table right that that it all generates from hydrogen well of course it does yeah and, and hydrogen all generates from something subatomic and i hope i'm not not misrepre misrepresenting that, but that's what I remember from Walter Russell. And uh, I also happen to know, I, I have a question for you because I, I mean, uh, I, I've done some research into what you're suggesting. Um, there's a company, I, I can't remember the name. I, I want to say it's Living Waters, but that may not be it. Um, they create uh, shaped tubes that are supposed to um, have a, like a filtration effect on water and, um, uh, are you aware of anything like that? Uh, are you talking about Grander Water? 
<sighs> that doesn't sound familiar, but it's I... like an Austrian company and they produce structured water. There's another group that's produced by a guy called Lowe. And Lowe talked about fusion technology using lasers to, to, to cohere matter in the 1970s. Yeah, well, I... When you say structured water, that's what I remember, that they, they are structurizing water. Yeah, so the, the, that probably is from Lowe. So there's two types of companies. There's one that's set up by Lowe, and he creates these uh, uh, um, uh, uh, structures in the water. But if you want to talk about synthesizing of elements, you have to look at Leclerc's work. So he, take, he took an aluminium, the same thing that I'm describing you use in this ultra experiment, right? And he, he had some aluminium sheet which was, I don't know, one mil thick, and it was perforated. And then he put that into a pump, which had a, 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 a depressurization at one end. So there was lots of cavitation. The thing is, the cavitation, if you want to synthesize heavy elements, has to be on one spot. The thing is, if you drive the coherent system too far, it will just go, and it will go, and it will go, and then it will synthesize elements that are outside of the normal periodic table, and they will fission back, and you'll create hot water. And in fact, what he did when he was at the, you know, I think the U.S. Naval Labs, research labs, just one hour of running that cavitator, it produced so much radiation that him and his partner took two years to recover, and they nearly died. So... I wouldn't be looking to run these uh, ultrasonic experiments with holding the aluminium in place. Uh, the reason I chose aluminium foil is because you, you get to a certain level of coherence and it starts synthesizing the elements. And it, in doing so, it's consuming the aluminium in, until it's broken away the aluminium and you only, you only have a hole. So it then can't continue to synthesize the heavier, the heavier elements. You know what I mean? It's, it's kind of like semi self limited. It, it hits like a saturation point where it's not able to. No, it, ri it rips the aluminium out or it's already converted it all. <laughs> right. Okay. So, so it, can, it can no longer so do the effect. It's self limiting. No yeah. 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 In the case of Leclerc, the, the cavitation was going on the same spot all the time. So, like, for instance, if you've got a propeller and it's cavitating and you synthesize other elements in the cavitation spots. It's constantly running through salty water. It's cleaning it away. It's, there's some variation and statistical variation. So it's not co the coherent matter doesn't build up and build up and build up and build up and build up. It's not a big snowball that makes everything like like Tesla saw running down a mountain in Serbia that gave him his idea that if you keep adding something resonantly to something, you can destroy anything. Right. That's what gave him his initial idea. So if, if you if you are looking at um, this system, it's it's self-limiting. In the case of his, he was having one millimeter al aluminium, and he was creating France, uh, you know, uh, Californium, uh, um, americium, and and you know, and fissioning these elements and producing cesium one thirty seven and strontium ninety, and and these are radioactive elements and toxic. But at the same time, it produces coherent matter waves, uh, which we've observed in the Vega experiment on camera and video, and these are the things that I believe have produced these things called strange radiation because the actual camera the tracks that we caught live with Dave and Hank's work on video are exactly the same form as those that have been observed since and uh, Solin observed them first and put them in his patent in 1992 as part of his quantum coherent nuclear reactor and so um, uh, you should avoid doing that kind of experiment but he created every element in the periodic table and so did Adamenko by putting too much energy into a point you you are forcing the uh the system to push well beyond the periodic table so the the, the nature in, in in the case of a marza with his vibrator plates that's very gentle he's got like 169 179 hertz vibrating up and down when i was there i, I took some ultrasonic microphones one one uh, uh a hydrophone and one a, a much higher frequency uh, 384 kilohertz microphone and within a few hours of, of starting our experimentation I established that there were ultrasonics involved and the first time I looked at the plates I could see the cavitation pits and on the cavitation pits we see the transmutation but he had already known he found that he he used his vibrator on on water and then after running for like 20 hours or 50 hours 100 hours or something he sent the water off for analysis and he had most of the elements in the periodic table that's incredible so Water running down a stream. If you've got a rock and the water's coming down here and it's moving around, it's producing a little cavitation bubble and the third most abundant element on Earth in the crust is aluminium, right? And that's producing the cavitation near that aluminium. 
is going to be synthesizing other elements. And those are going to be rich and they're going to be one or two atoms. Like, like they're like by all single atoms in that water. And when you drink that water, you would never even be able to detect the atoms in the water. This isn't like this well below trace, but they, they are well below nano. They are completely bioavailable and it tends to produce the elements for life preferentially. The things that if you look at the the George Oshawa, the inventor of the macrobiotic diet, the CNO kind of tree that he 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 came up with, um, basically it synthesizes your phosphorus, your potassium, your calcium, uh, your iron, all of the. But basically, if you start with with carbon and protons, you can synthesize all of the, almost every element that you use in your body really rather rapidly using this process. Maybe we need to start a coalition for uh, low energy nuclear reactions for nutrition. Oh, no, no, there are people doing that. There's a company called Synthestech. The, the, the analysis we had on sample 18, Coral Twist, uh, that w was conducted in Synthestech's lab in, in Russia. And uh, um, they've been uh, synthesizing bioavailable uh, atoms for, for, for uh, medication. Uh, or for for you know people to take uh, there's new laws just being introduced literally literally just being introduced to prevent this kind of thing being possible for humans just because literally of the source the not not because of the the chemical but because of the source of it the source of it the, the way that I they don't make know it. I, I because because I don't know whether it's in response to synthesis tech because everything I'm talking about is occult technology occult meaning hidden this this is the technology that no one wants normal the, you know the the this sort of little puppets to, to to understand and it's because it's so simple you know you can melt rock you can levitate rock you can travel extreme far extremely fast in in uh, you know a, any weather you can you can do everything that you, all these religious texts said that the gods were doing it's like i call it the god's toolbox and I, when i say god i mean in little in <laughs> little g like and with the end inverted commas i call it that it's a little g and inverted commas because it, you can take one aspect of this technology and pretend to be a god with it you can trigger volcanoes trigger earthquakes create weather systems you, because you go and look at the Lock, lockheed martin pattern they are saying using coherent matter waves you can do single bar thermal extraction what is that that my friends is taking energy out of something else at a distance and bringing it back well you know you might have heard someone else say that they can do that with orgone right it's the same thing, right? So you can make a cloud form and cause rain, which is exactly what they were doing with orgone technology. It's a single th bar thermal extraction. Okay? So and another thing that the patent says you can do is you can do cloaking. You can make a Tomahawk cruise missile look like a bit of a crummy black looking plane. We won't go into that. Well, it seems to me that all of these environmentalists, all these people who, who seem to want new energy solutions, this would be the first thing they'd be looking at if they were honest in their pursuit. Well, right now, uh, it, it, you could be using this, if you had nefarious goals, to pretend that there was a global warming crisis or global cooling or global climate change or whatever it is this week, right? You could use this technology to have a hot area over here or too much hurricanes down here or whatever. Right. Or, or form clouds, or, you know, or bring rain to a place Absolutely. that doesn't have rain. Just as John F. Kennedy said in, in one of his addresses, which you can go and look at in his archives, we have the technology to do change the weather. Just as you've got that Boeing, Boeing uh, um, uh, patents from whenever it was. Uh, and, and I believe Tesla claimed that this, this was possible as well. And, and it's in Tom Bearden's book from the 19, or books from the 1980s and onwards, his briefings uh, about that. And it's also in uh, the defense, I think the defense secretary of Clinton said that uh, other nations are using uh, um, uh, these electromagnetic technologies or whatever to produce uh, weather terrorism. They call it weather terrorism. But they can't let you know these technologies are real because they're all the same technology. They are all the same thing. It's, it's manipulating the structure of the physical vacuum, which in my opinion is a coherent condensate of cold neutrinos, or relic neutrinos.
and it's a constant mm. all life uses it and and if you rip rip the cold neutrino so so he, he, i've said this in my movie but you, you can go and see me talking about it in my movie but two anomalies that are easily explainable with relic neutrino influence right so i said when i was in sochi uh, alexander shishkin uh, uh, who works at dubna science city he um he, is, he had a cavitator, and his cavitator was producing these monopole structures that he calls string vortex solitons. And he gives credit to Ken Shoulders, and he says they're just the neutral form of magnetotoro electrical radiation. But they're just EVOs, by the way. They're the same thing. We job all lightning. But the neutral form comes out of the reactor, okay? And it leaves these birdies, he calls them. They look like a mushroom that you cut in half. And they also carry the nucleons of the material that they've travelled through. And he characterised over nine years that the depth and the width of the pits in, in, in the um, gel of the, the photographic film uh, is directly proportional to the uh, mass of the nuclei that have been teleported through the metal and the water and the air. Um, and so they've well characterised this. They've been studying this for nine years. And... Um, so if you want to know why people are getting in that paper, and I call it on the MFMP YouTube channel, my cha my translation and discussion on that is called uh, a new form of penetrating radiation in Shishkin. So you can go and look that up. Um, but uh, he described that, you know, the energy of particles being uh, shot out of these structures, um, uh, uh, you know, they, they cause... Um, damage per like can kill red blood cells and can cause uh dna damage in in white blood cells and as a result you know uh, he says that one hour exposure to his cavitator which is about the same time that nearly killed leclerc and his colleague um you would it would kill most men so when they're operating it they keep a distance okay of course if you were using this technology to take down a building you would expect people on the clear up site would end up with a lot of different cancers that no one expected they would have in multiple parts of their body because these things are shedding these these structures all of the time as the, as they're cooling down from from their coherent state anyway so you know you can explain everything every part of that observation uh, post 9 11 uh but uh, you, you, you have a, he said that um, after a while, his reactor stopped producing this radiation. And he had to literally, to, to get it producing this radiation again and, and producing these structures on the X-ray film, he had to literally lift up the cavitator and move it to another part of his lab. And what does that tell you? Um, I, I would imagine that the, the area was interfering with the, where it was, was interfering with the experiment. No, no, no. Take a strong magnet and have another strong magnet. And if I'm if I'm here and I've got another strong magnet over here and it doesn't influence it, I, I come over here and then it snaps to it, right? Right. It it has an event horizon. Okay. There's a field. It has a field which but has an event horizon. The event horizon is the point at which it's strong enough to pull the relic neutrinos from the air into through the metal and into the water and, and and condense them okay into the con condensates of relic neutrinos yeah and right. so what would this explain about 911 two things these things are highly magnetic in fact they produce these magnetic monopoles and it was a very very large monopole and it's the structure that consumes the building and the reason it died 70 meters around producing the yin yang under the ground is it, it fluidized the rock under there um you know which some people <laughs> like to pretend is some nuclear event but anyway um <laughs> well it's kind of nuclear but not in, in the way they're calling it but um anyway so uh, and it's the reason it throws the, the stuff out at 70 miles an hour. It's because of the structure of the monopole. Um, but anyway, it produces an intense magnetic field. So what does that do? Well, that was such a strong magnetic field that it, it, it interacted with the weak magnetic field. Or rather, sorry, it's not so much that it's a magnetic field. It's something that interacts with the things that are responsible for the magnetic current. Are you with me? Yes. Yes. Right. So... That is why your magnetometers go completely wonky from the time that the buildings are being charged to the end of building seven in your seven magnetometers in Alaska, thousands of kilometers away. Okay. Secondly, the co global consciousness. Problem. That's a massive field. It, well, it's, it's a massive interruption to the, the, the means by which magnetic current can flow. So it changed the magnetic field on the Earth. It was big enough to change the magnetic field on the Earth. Wow. So it, 
it's it, it's like uh, the I don't know. It's it's the equivalent of like a global hurricane. It just just a massive uh, a massive electromagnetic field that is affecting. Uh, it's a, it's a ma massive magnetic field. Yes, and that that was sufficient to adjust the magnetic field lines on the Earth, and and so the way you would you if you wanted to make a detector for the use of these weapons you would have a lot of spread out magnetometers or you would have you would have a, a um interferometer because it produces something akin to a gravity wave so i'm sorry if i'm making bad analogies here because i'm trying to just understand what you're saying uh but th i mean this is incredible what you're saying is incredible. So the second thing that's not not explained from 9-11, but that has, a, in my view, a kind of like, woo-woo, <laughs> this is coming from me, uh, <laughs> um, uh, explanation, is the, I think it's called the Global Consciousness Project. They, they had some atomic clocks that uh, produce random, number gen random, num random numbers. And they saw during the events of 9-11 that these uh, produced really weird outputs, something like that. And uh, they attributed that to the consciousness of so many minds in the world focusing on the event. No, I think it's much less complicated than that. These are cesium-137 or rubidium-87 clocks. Now, between 1988 and 1999, without knowing the cause, Xu Enju and his team in China found that during three-body alignments, these are alignments that align the sun, the moon, and the earth into a lens-like structure that lens... Uh, gravitationally lends the co relic cold neutrinos from the cosmos into a different flux they caused atomic clocks to change their count rate okay when you're inside wow. the number of, okay so this was already shown by in fact they not only did it between 1988 and 1999 they observed this in uh, um, data spanning decades uh, by looking at when when there were uh, eclipses solar or lunar eclipses and looking at the atomic clock data historically recorded from uh, uh, atomic clocks in the us for instance and they they found the same pattern going back you know decades and decades and so what you have is something they didn't know what was causing the action but the that the, they had established the atomic clocks changed their rate when you have uh, uh, a three-body alignment now it was in parker moll's book space earth human that he showed that the three-body alignment uh, uh, can cause uh, 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 the change in the relic neutrino flux and he is the person that showed that if you take cobalt 60 which is about five point whatever half years half-life beta isotope uh, uh, or cesium 137 or strontium yttrium 90 uh, and you uh, to have a focused cosmic uh, uh, relic neutrino flux onto this one millimeter by one millimeter sample you can change the inverse beta decay rate from that sample so you have a hundred percent proof from two independent sources that this occurs and it's due to relic neutrinos and you have a structure that is likely produced out, out of condensing relic neutrinos uh, into a magnet uh, a large pseudo magnetic monopole which gets to a point where the, the binding energy of the overall structure is is above that of any nuclei and it just consumes matter. It, it, it just makes it fall apart. <laughs> it just makes it fall apart. <laughs> so when you, when you uh, I just wanted to clarify, you said three body alignment. Can you, I, I don't think you've uh, defined that. So a solar or lunar eclipse, a solar or lunar right. eclipse. So either the, the, the sun is, is, is being masked by the moon in its way or the, the sun's rays on the moon is being masked by the earth. It, produ it pr produces a lens structure. And neutrinos of whatever type interact with two things, the weak force and gravity. And, and so uh, relic neutrinos, which can't, don't come from the sun, by the way, because their velocity is too slow to, ex uh, to uh, escape the sun's gravitational well. But they are responsible for much of the transmutations, according to uh, uh, Parkamov, on the sun. But there, there is, and 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 uh, Tesla was talking about. It, I think it was in 1932 or whenever, when when there was a discussion, 1930 or something. He talked about these infinitesimally small, uh, not particles. He, he called them corpuscles, uh, coming from the cosmos, like raining down on the Earth. So he kind of had a good hunch of what was going on. As far as I understand it, uh, Tesla discovered neutrinos, and, and I th I'm pretty sure he coined the word. Yeah, that's what that's what he, no, that's what he, the, the paper where he's d t saying that I already discussed these things in the 19 uh, in uh, the 1890s, but he didn't give them a name. Oh, he he then when when the when neutrinos were suggested, 
He then did a a, a a a newspaper article where he was discussing the fact that he tried. No one was listening back then, and that he was he had already discussed these uh, infinitesimally small corpuscles. I think he called them. Yeah, I think you're correct. I remember reading that. And and and, and I, I, I it was in response to the discussion about neutrinos. And I, I've I've done a video on that in the past when when I was uh, leading into the space Earth human work. And and even he suggested that his discoveries were of uh, he he thinks that he was just rediscovering he he didn't think that he actually made any original discoveries. I, I think that um, when you look at that part of the world, uh, the the Greek sort of uh, Serbian uh, Bosnian uh, Croatian peninsula, they learnt a huge amount from the Assyrian culture, probably from the G culture, from, from the uh, um, uh, uh, pharaohs and whatever. But th they were only still dragging up the, the um, what do you call it, uh, the Holy Grail. They were only trying to, they, they were working out what the Holy Grail was. <laughs> but th they, they were only still, the, the occult technology is, is just like, clearly it was being used all over the world because the symbols that were vilified during the Second World War were vilified only because they were used because the people that were trying to spend time in North Africa and the Middle East trying to discover them were the same people that they were they were there for the same reasons that the Holy Catholic Church was in that part of the world. And that's the same reason we had to go to into seven countries in five years and, and, and destroy them because the rediscovery meant you you had to destroy the evidence that this is eternal but also had been used by man before all over the world but principally the best evidence it was in the middle east and the real problem for them is whilst they got into northern syria they didn't get into uh, um, damascus and there's a vast amount in damascus damascus and even more important than that they did their work in afghanistan they got the guys to smash up the the, the religious places there they call it religious but it's just it's kind of like artifacts showing how the technology works um and and they 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 got the stuff that emptied out of the iraqi museums but the real problem is they have to find some way to get into iran and take control of the narrative there because they're still digging the evidence up they're still there's it's still digging fantastic evidence that shows exactly how this technology works <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this uh, all, everything you're saying seems to harken back for me to uh, the pyramids and, uh, for instance, John Hutchison's discovery, uh, or I, I know he's one of the people who discovered it as uh, the, the pyramids being a, an energetic uh, force. Uh, Absolutely. It's, sh it's shape energy. But, you know, when you understand that a diamond is largely similar to the half of a, a, a pyramid, one of its uh, uh, crystal structures, and that the diamond is the best electron emitter there is, um, and you know quartz is piezoelectric and, and the two most abundant elements in the earth's crust are silicon and oxygen which is quartz and uh, that's piezoelectric and uh, you know I, I suggested because here's the thing in 90, between 90, late 1950s and early 1960s it was published in New, New Scientist in 1963 I think it was Manchester University or something they, they found that they could take a magnetron and they could take a, a quartz uh, cylinder cut to length and they could fire the magnetron and it would produce solitons at the frequency of the mag uh, magnetron that would travel down the silicon uh, dark side, reflect off the back end and come out and there would be these little blips of microwave energy and then it would come down and you would get like a, a, a decaying pulse. What does that tell you? That tells you that you can convert electromagnetic energy into soliton, i.e phonons i.e vibration and in this paper they specifically say we can create vibration sound at the same frequency as the inter-nuclei distance of matter i i'm sorry that that went way over my head could, could you <laughs> that, that, that one went way over my head so that could you repeat that again i, I or, uh, elaborate a bit on right so you take you take microwaves right Microwaves, uh, whatever, 2.4 gigahertz. Let's call it 10 gigahertz. When you get to something like 10 gigahertz or 10,000 megacycles or whatever John Hutchison likes to call it. In fact, they refer to it like that in the in this uh, to a 1963 paper. And I've already already done videos on this in the past. Um, but when you excite the quartz with this electromagnetic wave, of course, it converts that into vibration. 
and it's converting it into vibration at the frequency because it's piezo it's converting it into the frequency of a sound wave at the frequency of the microwave and then that travels down and it comes down as it gets re reflected off the end some of it comes back and and gives a little microwave as it converts it back into electromagnetic waves yeah and then it goes back and forward and backward and forward so essentially you have a vibration that is able to be controlled right up to the interatomic spacing of nuclei which means if you are following my logic with this with this and you you essentially what you're doing is you're creating resonant nodes and at the resonant node it it's got a lot of energy going through it but it's not moving anywhere this forces coherence and if you've got coherence on the individual at atom layer what does that cause and so i suggested that the reason John Hutchinson's technology was working is because he's getting coherence uh, and you typically see the effect in the middle or one third in from the ends or uh, some fraction depending on the interacting frequencies and and that what you would need to do is to coat it with some sort of piezoelectric material and then two years later because this was in January 2018 so no it was in a year later or something you get the Salvatore Pi pattern where it's saying let's coat aluminium with PZT, right, and put it in a, sol a, 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 a solenoid and give it pulses, and it creates room temperature, so superconducting. Now, the, the US Navy can award itself a patent before I said anything, but the reality is, I don't think that's even patentable because it was in this 1963 research, at the, I think the University of Man Manchester published in New Scientist showing that you can create this interatomic spacing uh, uh, by by using a piezoelectric material and using microwaves. Wow. I, that's, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm speechless, honestly. That That is uh, quite a, uh, I, I, I can't even respond to that. It's amazing. That, that's an incredible experiment. When, when I realized all this at the beginning of 2000, when I realized that this at the beginning of 2017, by, by the beginning of 2018, I had finished producing a presentation called O-Day. Uh, it was 109 slides and I decided it was going to take me three to four years to run through that and we're getting through it let's put it that way we're we're, we're probably about 70 percent 80 percent of the way through it and uh, you know uh, my, my view was is uh, it literally it melted my brain and and I I was just realizing it so um, uh, it was just the enormity of of what what would what had to be got across and and what had to be done to make it unequivocal and so it, it was kind of like you, you can't say everything immediately because people will say you're completely bonkers and and maybe i am but anyway i don't think you um, are at all <laughs> and you, you can't i don't think you are <laughs> well the, the thing is everything i've said is demonstrable and provable and since i've said it there's been these patents published which say not only that they've been published since they they've always been at you know if if the U.S. government is is awarding a patent to itself, it can always backdate it to before you said it. Right. <laughs> who's who's going to find out? But I mean, so, uh, similar to Pons and Fleischmann, you don't want to come out and say cold fusion when you're not sure that it's that it's fusion. Yeah, but the the point is about a lot of what I'm saying is I realized kind of like how it must be occurring because of physically looking at John Hutchison samples, physically looking at these lion reactors, physically looking at so many different experiments and, and using that kind of like Schauberger, you know, uh, observe and copy nature type thing. Just look at what it's actually physically doing. No equations, no opinions, no hand waving. Just look at what it's doing. And what is nature trying to tell you as, as, as uh, uh, Francesco Piantelli said when we were with him in January 2015, he said, don't tell nature what it is, let it show you. And that stuck in my mind. What is nature trying to say with everything that I'm looking at? And it, it led me to believe that only certain things were possible. It had to be this. And then I found the Solon patent. And then a month later, I found from 1992, which literally had many of the structures discussed. And it had a sketch and the sketch included every feature that I'd, I'd taken photos of, macro photos of, scanning electron microscopy, and the transmutations that he's describing were the transmutations that we were observing in these structures, right? Right. <laughs> so it's like, right. there, there can't be two universes here where in his universe, he finds exactly the same thing and I find exactly the same thing. 
And they're not the same thing. They must be the same thing. He must have seen exactly what I saw, which means this is what it is. And then a month later to find the coherent matter wave things when when it's just it's it is how it works. People need to understand that and and what I have been focused on with anyone that will listen <laughs> um, is there's really, really stupid, simple experiments that you, if it, like I say, if you're, if I've said this before, I think if, if you have a, a, a qualification, like let's say you're a doctor or I don't know what, and you think it's worth more than soiled t toilet paper, um, you can take yourself to the 9-11 museum and you can scrape off a little bit of aluminium from that fire truck that's got a hole in it and you will most likely find that it has synthesized nickel in there and the synthesized nickel will have a disproportionate ratio to natural ratio of the nickel isotope 61. It will most likely have a lead in there synthesized and it will have a disproportionate ratio of the isotope lead 207. Why? Because they're fermionic. The rest of them are bosonic. The structure likes to crush things into a small box. I've been saying that for years, but it's not actually a box, it's a sphere. That's why we get these iron crenellated spheres. But if you push it too hard, it creates heavier and heavier elements. But things that are formed as fermions, they can't live in a bosonic condensate, so they get kicked out. So you get a disproportionate synthesis of the, the non-bosonic isotopes in there. One of them is hydrogen, the other one and the first lightest radioactive element and pretty much the only radioactive element that's synthesized by Lena and has proved as being uh, produced by Lena is tritium. And what do you see at the, on ground zero? You see a 50 times uh, natural background of tritium. That's correct. Well, I, I'm glad I'm glad you, you brought it back to 9-11, what, what you said, uh, you know, don't don't tell nature what it is, uh, you know, see what it's telling you. Uh, that takes me right back to uh, really the, the purpose for my show, uh, which comes back to uh, my, one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Judy Wood. Uh, it is, um, empirical evidence is the truth that theory must mimic. Must explain. <laughs> or is it must explain or something like that? Uh, mimic. Must, must mimic. Uh, mimic. Must, must mimic. mimic, yeah. yeah. And, and that that's, for me, it's... I'm going to do a presentation on Sunday. I'm going to pretty much fully explain how you get the cold fusion process. I've already explained it in a blog post. I, t I tend to put it out there anyway first so that it can't be unsaid. But I, I want to go probably this Sunday into more detail. Um, and uh, uh, because I don't want these European projects to fail. They they're the first properly funded European projects. There's two of them. And it's funny, you know, <laughs> I tried to get one institution involved and they were like, la la la, and then the, no, nothing, no joy out of them for years. And I tried to get London Imperial involved and, uh, you know, they laughed me, literally, literally laughed me out of the building. Okay. And now they received a, what, a 700,000 euro grant in part because of the work I did as a, a, and the, the researchers we did as, as lowly open researchers earning nothing. They're sitting on money. Now, I want them to make something useful for it. And I've met some of these people in these projects and I'm absolutely disturbed at the... the they, they just don't know anything about the field. It's not even that they're... It's not even that they are... Um, willfully ignorant uh, or, or they, they've got their own thing that they have to do and that's what they're doing it's like they don't don't know anything and 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 it's like well you know I don't want to get 10 years older again like because I've been doing this since 2011 basically for 10 years I don't want to be another 10 years and watch people make the same mistakes it is this it is coherent matter it is able to transmute synthesize and uh, uh, desynthesized matter. It's all there in Solin's 1992 pattern. It's all there in the early work through to the conclusion in 2001 in the letter to fusion technology of Takaaki Matsumoto. It's all there in Ken Shoulder's work, although between Solin and Takaaki Matsumoto, you, you kind of really can get a good grasp of what's going on. And it, you don't have to reinvent this wheel. It's already been reinvented by, by these characters that I'm discussing, these incredible scientists that dedicated a large proportion of their life. You are watching this on a computer or listening to this on a computer or, or on a, 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 a smart device, 
And it's only because of Ken Shoulders inventing the technology to screen uh, microelectronics that you are able to do that. And that person then spent the last 33 years of his life trying to work out what John Hutchison had done. Like, he had to believe that was valuable. You don't do that as someone with that kind of capability of mind. In fact, Takaki Matsumoto built on his entire career in nuclear science and spent the rest of his life, of his professional life from 1998, uh, 1989 rather, to the end of his professional life researching this phenomenon. And Solin, you know, I guess he did the same thing. He, he had his 2002 patent, direct electricity generation, that the US Patent Office turned down because cold fusion doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh... Uh, I think what we're up against is the uh, arrogance of corporate science. They, it's, uh, it's not so much a willful ignorance. It's not so much uh, compartmentalization. It's that it's that they are so arrogant that they have they have inflated egos and they're not willing to listen. And uh, will I think we, we can just make I them? I don't even think it's that sinister. I think what it is, they're on a grind. And I experienced this when I was at Aarhus. They're worried about where their next chunk of money is coming from to pay for their lab, to pay for their job, to pay for their pension, and to give a little bit of money to some PhD students so that they can do something useful. And it is but just in the meantime, grind. they are shooting down others. You know, there is there right, is they're a. They're only shooting it down because if if it makes a complete farce of what they're doing. But they already know the answers. They already know Carl fusion doesn't exist. They already know you can't transmute matter. And that's they what already I'm, know that. That's what I'm calling arrogance that from my perspective that is just pure it, arrogance i don't think it's that, a sinister that that it's arrogance i i i think it's reflected indoctrination they i literally had someone at aarhus university wow. i had someone at aarhus university tell me to my face this is not possible and if you want to know how impossible it is go and read a textbook they literally said that to my face right so, so they're true believers they're true believers. They, they, they are. They are in a religious. They're in a religious. Uh, um, but it, it, it's so difficult. And this is the, the thing about the event. People have been told what to think, and once someone is takes on board a belief of what how something occurred, it's very difficult to change their mind. It's very difficult. Yes. And, and the powers that be, whoever they are, they know this about human nature and they use it all of the time. Get the narrative out, say it, 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 until people don't want to hear any other narrative. And they will, they'll go, I've heard enough of this, it happened like this, everyone else agrees it happened like this, so that's how it happened. And the reality is what they program. Yeah. And so you are fighting a, a, well, an I, unaman... I... Go, sorry, what? Well, I, yeah, I just I completely agree with you. I mean, it, it, what we uh, have to do is much what is much the same of what we've seen in low energy nuclear reactions, which has now become various companies, uh, Blacklight Power, Berluin Energy Corporation. Well, uh, uh, there's sorry, a number there's of others. Blacklight Power, which is now Brilliant Light Power. They say no, there's no low energy nuclear reactions going on. That's true. That's true. Um, but but they do recognize that there are likenesses between their experiments and Pons and Fleischmann, although they won't explicitly say low energy nuclear reactions. Uh, yeah, uh, from from the point that point I can agree on because it's condensing matter, it's cohering matter. That's what it is doing, and it is making matter into a denser structure. Right. It's coming back to the coherent matter uh, conclusion that you've come to. Um, I think that the way that we combat the scientific arrogance, as I call it, uh, although I, I think you're probably probably right that it that it is a it's a reflect uh, it's reflective misinformation or i'm not sure what uh the exact term that you use but it that's that seems about right to me Right. And I, I think that the way that we combat that is we continue to show that it is possible. We all, we, you know, last, 
like you're doing. We continue to speak to the people who will listen. And uh, eventually the evidence... You have to be relentless. You have to... Ryan, you have to be relentless. You have to pound it. 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 Because you need to uh, deprogram people. Absolutely. And the only way you can do that is with hard, hard, hard facts. Now, the point about those iron-rich FeO2 crenellated microspheres... We have created something that has only been discovered in 2016 in extremely expensive equipment, probably in much smaller quantities than we have synthesized in multiple places <laughs> in the one, the one sample uh, of iron, uh, iron oxide, uh, uh, FeO2. But that they are saying themselves in nature, that it, the publication nature, that this can only occur above 750,000 atmospheres. So you say, well, I haven't got a diamond anvil. Find my diamond anvil. And if I haven't got my diamond anvil, and this is FeO2, what's going on? What's going on? How did that pressure occur? Right, where did it how? come from? Tell me, you tell me. Then how did these iron-rich crenellated spheres appear in my less than $30 domestic ultrasonic jewelry and dentures cleaner? How did it occur? And if you want to enlighten yourself and you don't want to live a delusion for the rest of your life and die with a lie, buy yourself a $30 uh, uh, ultrasonic cleaner, run the experiment. If you've got access to an SEM, great. If you haven't, you can see things with a microscope or you can even do things with a magnet. You, you can buy like a $70 Nurugu uh, lens for your smartphone and put that on and have a look at the structures under there. Go on, do this, and then tell yourself over and over again that what you're seeing repeatedly every time you do this experiment doesn't exist. Tell yourself that until you are convinced that it's not real. That's right. This reminds me. This reminds me of one of my favorite responses to to the dissenters of Dr. Judy wood uh and her book where did the towers go uh i i remember someone told me that uh they, they were talking with a scientist who said she's absolutely wrong there's there's nothing correct here and she said she handed him the book and she said can you tell me where she's wrong because because you have to get them to look they they, they don't look at the evidence as when you when you put it in their face and you say can you tell me on what page what paragraph you know what reference tell me where the flaw is well, the great thing what Judy, what Judy did was she just showed the evidence. I mean, there's very little uh, uh, assumptions and and very little. Uh, in fact, I'd almost say there's almost no assumptions, and and there's very very little uh, um, discussion around it. She's just painting a picture. What happened here? This is what happened. Why did it happen? This is what happened. Why did it happen? Yeah, you know, what? Why did the firefighter's hat fly fly, fly off his head? Why was this fight? This person. Uh, levitated and, and flew a block what why did this person come out of a, a dark building and and suddenly all in instantaneously all of the cars seem to turn into some sort of plasma state at the same time illuminating his way why did this guy surf down many stories uh, and was uninjured uh, you know all of these stories are the actual testimonies of people that experienced the event and then you get people that come along who think they know science and they're saying well blah, 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 blah. this can't happen yeah, all, all they continue to do is dismiss, but what they won't do is address the specific uh, points of evidence, the specific effects that we have observed. They, they'll just say that it, it didn't happen or they will ignore it entirely. And I think that we continue to shove it in their face. You're doing a great job on your uh, YouTube channel. I, I didn't set out to do this, by the way. I didn't set out to do this. And even when I discovered it, I didn't want to do it, but I had to, to maintain my integrity. And I, it, the most unbelievable thing for me was to have observed the iron-rich crenellated spheres produced in uh, so many different systems. I didn't go looking for them. It's just when you find these spheres, they happen to be iron-rich crenellated spheres. And it's like, okay, there's another one. And it's in a completely different technology. And, and, so, and then you right. get to the point where uh, that, was, that was on 9-11, uh, 2021. And on the Monday, before I rebroadcast that on the evening... Uh, I'm in the lab and we're just looking to see what we suspect is the core of this magnetic monopole or ball lightning structure that, that did the channels in the Vega Valley sample. And you, you go in and it's behaving very weirdly. It's doing something with the electrons, producing its own little atmosphere of electrons around it. But you somehow manage to get it so it doesn't charge. And you get in there and it's an FeO2 iron-rich crenellated sphere. 
And then you find there's multiple ones of them and they are in the center of the channels. You know, not all exclusively, but mostly. And it's like, well, there, there was no meteorite shower inside this vacuum chamber, inside this steel chamber, inside this barn. There, there was no meteorite that landed these things directly in these structures, you know. And, and they are FeO2. They're not necessarily the magnetite or whatever that you typically get when you've got water and, and stuff involved. And, and so you, you have a scenario where um, it, the, the evidence is impossible to explain even using the stuff published in Nature. <laughs> because no diamond anvil was involved. And, 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 and to find that in a system right. where you know you are creating something that's equivalent to ball lightning, you can see it on the film. <laughs> you can see it. There's the coherent, the double layers. It's there. You can physically see it on the recording of the experiment that produced that sample. And, and, and so it's without a shadow of a doubt, that is what produced it. And then you find these iron-rich crenellated microspheres. And you have... Takaaki Matsumoto, you, you have uh, uh, Ed Lewis, you, you, you have uh, John Hutchison, you have Tesla, you have Ken Shoulders, you have all of these people saying that it's ball lightning and ball lightning will be doing exactly the same thing. And not only that, in the ball lightning in Hestaland, studied by the Italians in, in Norway, it produces these ball lightning in the air but they tracked where this ball lightning collided with the ground and where it collided with the ground they took soil samples and you know what they found in that soil sample an iron rich crenellated microsphere amazing and and i guess we could say at this point expected from my point of view every single lightning strike not every single lightning strike every little finger coming down to the ground is one that finally makes the connection with the ground and then the discharge goes through that path of least resistance, yeah? But if, when it comes down, what's happening is you've got the ball lightning and the ball lightning gets too energized and it splits up into self-similar clusters that then go off in their own little way. And they're working as a team to find the, the point that it can discharge through. But the first one, it's like winner takes all, right? But every single one of these, and these little, these, these four will come down and then another one will come. One of those four will then split into another group. Yeah, and each one of those will be creating, in my view, an iron-rich iron and oxide, specifically, specifically iron and oxygen, <laughs> rich crenellated. So it for it, 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 it's like a net of ball lightning. I mean, that's how I'm imagining what you're saying. Uh, go and look at the slow mo guys. Uh, they did. I've actually been on this building for my sins. It's it's the uh, building in in uh, Singapore, which has uh, looks like it's got a boat spread across three towers. I've actually stood up there. It's pretty spectacular. But anyway, they 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 took some slow motion of ball lightning. Uh, sorry, of lightning from there, and you can see the tendrils coming down and splitting, and then more than and then they're splitting again. I'm telling you right now that though, like in one of their captures, they probably have. I don't know, 30, 40, maybe 50, maybe many more than that, individual tendrils that are produced before one makes the full discharge winner takes all. Yeah? Wow. Right? Yeah. And I'm saying to you now that every single one of those will have produced, uh, at its core, an iron-rich crenellated microsphere. And, that, and that's a testable uh, prediction there. And I think, I, you know, based on everything that you've said, I can see. I, I can pretty much guarantee that most of these things that you can go and have a look at these micrometeorite hunters and they go around in like uh, car parks and, and uh, they look in gutters, like gutters collect these things, are washed off the roof and, and they collect them using a, a, a magnet and then they put them under the microscope and go, oh, look, I found a micrometeorite. No, sorry, probably haven't. Not a micrometeorite. You're finding the ball lightning core. And there's even this study done, It's there's this study, I think, in Nature, where they found these iron-rich crenellated microspheres, which look absolutely identical to the ones found in the event in Australia. And they're saying that these are 2.7 billion years old, and they're blah, 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 rubbish. Rubbish. It's all rubbish. It's all rubbish. It's pseudoscience. It really is pseudoscience. <laughs> right. That's the true pseudoscience. They're, they start with theory, and they work backwards. I mean, that's that's the issue, right? Yeah, the, the point is that they've never seen these things produced in a few minutes in, in by a five-year-old. So they, 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 that's the only thing they can think they can be because like it's a sphere, it must have got to very high temperatures. No, it's coherence. 
you, it, what I learned from that Lockheed Martin patent is that Bose and, and, and Einstein proposed the uh, Bose-Einstein condensate uh, and then people tried to achieve it by going to near absolute zero. The reason they're going to absolute zero is because you want the same atom at the same temperature. Why do you want the same atom at the same temperature? Because then the wavelength or uh, f function that describes the matter uh, is, is the isotope uh, in combination with its thermal temperature. And so to get them to be in the same, way, same, way, same wavelength, you have to get them all to exactly the same temperature. And the easiest way to do that is to try and get them down to absolute zero. And then they will self-organize, right? Now, they correctly argue, and I learned this from the Lockheed Martin patent, which is awarded, right? That this can occur at any temperature. It can occur at room temperature. It can occur, occur at body temperature. It can occur at a million degrees. It can occur at Googleplex degrees. You only need every single participant in the matter to be at exactly the same temperature, and they will tend to, given a restricted environment, go into phase. Because they do. You, you, go, you ever go to an evangelical church? Everyone's getting that, in phase, right? <laughs> when, you, when you say it's in phase, that, that is coherence. Uh, yeah, but to get to coherence, like, so for, uh, imagine a laser. A laser is the same frequency of light, but in phase right? The light has no mass. However, when you're talking about matter, matter also has the energy contained in the matter. So if you get the matter as a wave in phase and in same frequency, it is then able to cohere and it has vastly more energy. All of the weapons you're seeing, which they're calling lasers, they're not lasers. These things that Lockheed Martin are shooting their drones down with and are going to be attached to next generation fighter jets, they're not lasers. They're coherent matter beams. They're saying it in their patent. They've known about it for a very long time. The get jig was up and they had to release it into a patent, make it public so that they could roll it out into 20, this year in, into the next generation. You, you want to know why they don't care about those 83 billion of stuff left in, in, in Afghanistan? It's just rubbish. <laughs> it's rubbish in the face of this technology. So just to differ differentiate the two because I, I can sort of hear in the back of my head uh some people saying uh you know uh, couldn't it be lasers and uh, coherent well as i said low in the 19 in 1972 73 he showed or, or argued that you could use uh, a, a laser to uh, assist in the coherence of matter and in fact if you look at dennis letts and david dennis cravens they actually used interfering lasers to produce cold fusion and so that is forcing a coherent state, in my view, using coherent light. You're, you're, you're forcing the oscillations at, at, at the, the beat frequency between the two lasers, which it, they targeted at a, a terahertz beat frequency, which is at the frequency of the interatomic spacing between matter. And that's exactly what I, was, I said you could do by using interfering fields. Well, that and and, and uh, once again, harkens back to Dr. Wood talking about the uh, the separation of atoms the uh, creation of new elements uh at ground zero so i i mean this has been a, an extremely enlightening conversation i uh i hope it will be immensely helpful for other people in their research and understanding of of this uh energy and uh i like i said i'm going to be working i'm going to buy the equipment and i'm going to do the uh ultr experiment that uh you posted about and uh, I'll let you know how I do with that. I hope that you and I can stay in communication. I, I, I really have appreciated this conversation. Sure, Ryan. And, and have fun with it. Have fun if you, if you, you know, you can achieve a lot with even uh, uh, some people have uh, modified the experiment so that they can have a light, a strong light from one side and they can use their camera's uh, slow-mo function and they, you can actually see what it's doing. It's just... It's wonderful. I don't understand how general science did not pick this up. I, I don't understand it. I really, in my brain, I'm, I'm confused as to why such a simple thing was never observed before. And, and given the fact that, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm just using pattern recognition. And obviously, that, that uh, crop circles, the, the S shape with the two spots in the middle, that is the functional part of a yin-yang. It is the functional part of the yin yang. Maybe we could pick up on that uh, next episode. Uh, I, I think that 
this this has been a very interesting conversation. I I, I want to ask you more about that, but I figure we'll go on for probably another three hours. So, uh, and uh, you know, I, I wouldn't mind it, but I certainly want uh, my audience to be able to digest what what we've talked about so far. Um, so, I really thank you so much for being on the show today, and I uh, hope to have you back soon. Ryan, we are at the big dawn of an old age. Love it. Be a part of it. Let's work together. Let's cohere.